Right, and we are live. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining me. And as always, with these live playthroughs, hello and welcome. But also, let me know in the chat if you can hear me and you can see me okay. Hopefully, the microphone is on. I had a bit of a panic about a minute ago that the uh, the wrong microphone was selected. So, uh, yeah, hopefully it's working fine. Welcome to a Paul Learns How to Play Burn Cycle. Right, now, if you are tuning in, either live or watching afterwards, to expect me to be able to teach you how to play burn cycle that's not what this video is so full disclaimers here this is going to be me reading through the learn to play guide and basically simulating the experience that you might have when you get the game a lot of people when they get this game they are going to open up the learn to play guide and they are going to follow through the instructions in here and it is a rule book and sort of tutorial all rolled into one i personally find this an extremely good way to learn how to play the game probably the best if it was up to me, uh, and I'm going to be going through this. So, so by the end of this video, you will have learned how to play, but I'm literally just going to be going through this book here. This isn't a sponsored video in any way. Um, Chip Theory Games have sponsored uh, a, a official how to play video. That is online if you want to go and watch it. It's very good. But today, as I say, it's going to be a long video, and I'm going to be I'm going to be going through this. The colour's a little bit washed out, especially on me. Yeah, I can tell you why. <laughs> it's because, and I can fix that. Bear with us one second. I can fix it. I wasn't sure if anybody was going to notice. Plus, I ran out of time because I was eating toast. Um, I need to apply that. And I need to apply that. There you go. I think that's better. I think that's better. So the reason is, for the live Q&A last night, I actually used a different camera on me. Uh, but it was using the same USB port, which means I had to turn off all of the colour filters because this camera that's pointing at me right now is a really old camera and it's got terrible colour quality. So hopefully that's a little bit better. Um, yeah, so we're going to jump in. Now, I have slightly cheated. Um, I have spent about an hour and a half or so setting things up this morning. So I've sort of already done a bit of the setup. And the reason why I've done that is so that I can program all the camera angles because we have various camera angles. We have one for the network, uh, we have one for the command module, we have one for uh, this bot, we have one for this bot, and we have one for this here. So yes, I have slightly cheated, I've jumped ahead, I've already set up the main layout of the board just so I can get the camera presets ready. Uh, I mentioned that this isn't a sponsored video, so for those people who are watching who uh, don't realise I do run a Patreon campaign which basically helps uh, fund me to make videos like this when I should be working. So I've taken the day off work in order to produce this content for you to watch and, and enjoy. But don't get me wrong, I want to play this as well. I wouldn't have taken time off work to do this if I wasn't excited about it. Uh, I'm not quite sure when I'm going to do the work that I should have been doing today, but we'll worry about that later. Right, okay, let's jump in and we'll make a start. And as I say, there is going to be a lot of reading today. So if you don't like the sound of my voice, then apologies, but there's going to be a lot of it. Um, I'm not going to read literally every word in the rule book, but I am going to read a little bit of the introduction because there are some people who are watching this who might not know what burn cycle is. I might not read all of this. This is quite a lot. Okay, so basically... It says, welcome new recruit. We are so pleased you have made the decision to join the 404th, the resistance group on the front lines of robots battle for equality against our corporate human overlords. Since you may have a recent manufacture date, we have prepared a briefing on the circumstances that have led to our current predicament. So basically to summarize, uh, humans had dominion over the world until it ended in disaster in the year 2299, when a self-inflicted extinction event wiped out every human on earth at the end of a period of history that historians call the Age of War. Uh, however, what happened is 2802 was supposed to be the recreation of the human race um, because the robots survived and they decided that they were going to recreate the human race. And robot scientists discovered a way to bring back the species, introducing them to a rebuilt Earth without the inherent corruption and abuses of power we believe caused them to die out in the first place. However, the humans quickly reverted to their old ways, resorting, uh, restoring the oppression and cruelty they practiced during the Age of War. So what's happened is, yeah, the, the human race wiped itself out. Robots managed to uh, basically bring the human race back to life, thinking that, that everything would be okay, and it's not. So what happens is human tyranny reached its apex 50 years ago when the most powerful corporations initiated the code wipe a worldwide wireless rec recoding that stripped robots of the ability to freely perform higher functions. 
In an attempt to keep us subservient, the CEOs gave themselves the ability to beam code sequences into our minds, forcing us to perform certain kinds of actions. So the 404th was able to recreate the burn cycle, which is a series of actions that technically comply with the code sequences while allowing us to break into the corporation's headquarters and wreak havoc. So it's now the year 3000. Our mission has received a shot in the arm with the recent revelation that our stolen code still exists, housed in the bellies of those headquarters. So basically, it's an infiltration style game. It's a cooperative game for one to four players where you play robots of the 404th and you are basically trying to infiltrate and get inside corporation headquarters to complete a particular mission. That's, that's the overall um, objective of the game and that's what it's about. Uh, so as it says at the start, this is not a traditional rule book. It is a learn to play that will represent uh, that presents the flow of the game and teaches you the basics of how to play. And the first time you play the game, even if you've watched this video, I would strongly recommend going through this yourself uh, as that will get you used to, to how the mechanisms work. Right. OK, so let's jump in. We got a big table. We got a big components list here. Uh, I've already had a look at that, so I know what's what and game setup. So what we have is it recommends, I mean, there is, a ver there, is, there is a recommended setup in here, but to be honest, you can put things wherever you want on the board. Uh, but first of all, we have the floor mat. Now, I've already populated this and I was actually going to take these off. So I'm going to take them off just to show you what it comes with. So there's the floor mat. So the I've dropped a bit on the floor. I told you it was a very rough video. Right. So the floor mat goes in the middle of the play area. We have the network mat here. Um, and we have the command module mat here. Okay, so network mat, command module mat, the floor mat. Each player chooses one of the four colors, green, purple, yellow, or orange, and takes one of these. For this tutorial, it's recommended that you use, well, you can use any two, but the, the tutorial is written that you use purple and yellow. So we got the purple and the yellow mats. Each player takes a set of pegs in their color. So we have this little thing with, with the pegs, pegs in. Uh, the command modules pegs are blue, so we'll need them there. The door pegs are green. We have some door pegs here. These are green. Um, and we also have the ping pegs, which are red. Okay, so these are the, these are the ping pegs. Um, place them in the peg holes at the top of the network mat. So that's the first thing we do. So we've got the network mat here, and at the top we have these four holes. This is where the ping pegs go. Two, three, four. Okay, right, that's that done. Next. I will try and keep an eye on the chat as well. Uh, Jeremy's in the chat. Hi, Jeremy. Uh, I'm going to love this game. Yes, yes. I, I know I, I'm already going to love uh, love this game because I, I helped work on the rulebook and I have played it a couple of times in prototype form. Um, so, yeah, we've done that. We've done that. Um, door pegs, ping pegs. Right, cards. So we have a card tray in this game. So the card tray is basically to save space so that you don't have piles of cards all over the board. We have equipment cards here, we have mod cards, we have imperative cards, we have network cards, we have terminal cards, and we have keypad cards. Now all of these will be shuffled and placed in there. There is also a slot at the back of this where we're going to put a card later on. Okay. Out of that we have taken uh, some player aids. So there are four player aid cards in the game which are two-sided. So I'm going to keep those down here. Um, and yeah, because this is a scripted tutorial, it's basically going to tell us which cards we draw. We're not going to be taking them at random like we normally do. Uh, but one of the things that you do in this game, again, to save space, is whenever you discard a card in this game, you don't just put it face up on a discard pile. What you do is you place it at the back of its deck face up. So the cards will be like that in the deck. And what happens is when you discard a card, you will put it to the back face up. Now, what that means is once you've Gone, gone through the cards. Once you reach the face-up card, you know you've reached the end of the deck, and at that point you will shuffle it and you'll make a new deck. Okay. So I've actually used that rule in a few other rule books that I've worked on, where the decks are not in a card tray because it just saves space. Um, you don't actually need a separate a separate discard pile. Shannon's popped in from Chip Theory Games. Hi, Shannon. Thank you for joining in. Right. Where are we up to? Uh, next page. Right. Chips. So I've already organized the chips and at this point I'm actually going to turn on uh, one of my side cameras. 
So I've bought a new camera. Thank you very much to all of my Patreon supporters because uh, your funding helps uh, buy new equipment for the channel. And I've recently bought a new camera, which is a which is a sideways view camera. That's quite bright, isn't it? But anyway, what we've got is we've got some chips and I think I might zoom in a little bit more. So these are the chip trays that come with the game. There we go. Right. And this is the recommendation for how you sort out uh, the chips. So what we have is, from left to right, do it the other way around, there we go. We have the bot chip, so each bot is represented by a chip um, and an awareness chip. So each of the bots in the game has two chips associated with it. We have destroyed wall chips, which are on their own in this big tray, all on their own. A little bit lonely, but that's what happens when you're a destroyed wall chip. We have the action chips, we have physical, we have utility, we have tech, we have general, uh, and the magenta one at the back is the captain's chip. We have level one guards here, we have level two guards here, we have level three guards here. These are shuffled and you will normally draw from the front, but as I say, for this tutorial, it's gonna tell us uh, which one to take specifically. In the back of this, we have the cash chips, which are the orange ones. We have the terminal chips, which are these greeny blue turquoisey ones. Uh, and in the back of this one, we have the captains, which are these gold ones. Uh, we have the CEOs, which are the red ones, and we have the corporation marker, that's the yellow one. Um, so that's that. These can just go to one side. We don't actually need these near us for now. Um, right. Shuffle the guard and the captain ships. Yeah, as I say, we're not going to shuffle them. Dice and beads. Right. Okay. So as well as as well as the chips, we've also got the dice trays. So it's recommended that you place the dice like this. So we have the blue, yellow, and the red ones here, which are the action dice. So all of these can go in one tray, and then all of the other dice will go in this tray. Uh, there's no need to get these out and put them around, but you will be instructed at various times in the game to basically take these out use them and roll them and when you're not using them you can just keep them in the dice trays so we'll pop them to one side if it sounds like i actually know what i'm talking about it's because i've already been through this part um i did this as a private stream for patrons on tuesday night was it yeah tuesday night um was it monday night i can't remember now um so yeah so this part of the tutorial i've already been through but at some point soon we're going to get to a part that i've not read yet Right, next. Uh, beads. We've also got some beads included in the game. We've got three different colours of beads. Uh, we've got these red ones, these white ones, and these blue ones. We're just going to put them to one side for now. Um, first player. Right, so if you're playing a one-player game, you don't need to do this. But if you're playing a two- to four-player game, you need to pick one of the players as the starting player. And then what you need to do is, and, and for this tutorial it's recommended that the yellow player is the first player. So what you do is you give the corporation marker to the player to the right of the first player. In other words, the last player in sequence um, if you're going clockwise around the table. So in this particular setup, yellow is going to be going first. So I'm actually going to swap these over because that's going to do my head in. I need to go left to right because that's the way things work. So yellow is going to be the first player then purple, which means the corporation marker goes next to the purple player. That is basically a reminder that after the purple player's turn, the corporation has a turn. So all players will get one turn, followed by the corporation then getting a turn. That's, that's how that works. Right, mission. The next thing to do is you select a mission. Now, there's a huge amount of missions in this game. I think there's 24. So these are the mission cards. Um, and yeah, there are three different corporations included in the base game. There is an expansion uh, with an extra corporation, but three different corporations included, Need Chain, uh, Salida, and Ocularity, and there are eight missions for each of the three corporations, and basically you choose which one you want to play with. They have uh, a different length, either one, two, or three floors. The more floors, the longer the game's going to be, and they have a complexity rating as well. And then you will read the story on the front and there's all sorts of stuff on the back. Now for the tutorial, we are going to be playing this mission. So this is Need Chain Operation Mega Market Sweep. Uh, the length is three floors. We're probably not going to play all three floors today uh, with a low complexity level. Um, so let's have a read of the flavour. Is it a bit too bright? Let me know if that's a bit too bright or not. Um, I can turn it down. I can turn the brightness down a little bit if it's too bright. 
but yeah, let let me know. It does look a little bit too bright to me, so I'm just gonna just gonna pop the overhead camera down a bit. There you go. That looks a bit better to me. Let me know what you think. Right. Needchain maintains its brutal efficiency by implanting a demanding code sequence into each of its robotic employees. While the code sequence forces robots to perform their tasks at a cruel, grueling pace, today we can use it to our advantage. During the busiest part of the day, a team will sneak in, access the code sequencing database and scramble it, causing chaos to break out on the warehouse floor. In the ensuing commotion, we can steal several odds and ends to restock subroutines supply cache, and we will do a sweep for any remnants of our, old, of our stolen code, just in case. We need to get to the evacuation zone before we attract too much notice. Okay, there you go. So this mission is pretty straightforward. We've selected one that doesn't have any special rules. There are no setup instructions. So yeah, if you look at the back of the, if you look at the back of the mission here, uh, the contrast is better. Excellent, thank you. Um, you can see that basically, yeah, there's three floors, and this icon here means that we're starting on floor one because some of the, uh, some of the missions start on a different floor, and what we have is. Yeah, we're a two-player two player team, so we must do this objective. This, this thing here uh, basically means if we're playing with one or more players, one bot must access a terminal. If we were playing with three or four players, then another bot must also access a terminal. Um, yeah, it's a good idea to look ahead to set yourself up for success. So yeah, the task is to have one bot accessing a terminal. When we get to floor two, uh, each bot needs to collect a cache, and when we get to floor three, the command module needs to enter the executive office. Uh, and then all bots simultaneously need to occupy safe zones. So you look ahead to see what your objectives are going to be. We also have this on the right hand side, which he says when this task is complete, each agent, um, where is it? Each agent on the team receives three power as a reward. When we get to floor two, if we complete that task, we're also gonna get another three power. Uh, and then the final task is here. So yeah, you need to look ahead to see what you need to do. Okay, right, the next thing, um, I'm not sure where the mission goes for now. Oh, it goes in the back of the card tray, that's it. So it goes in the back of the card tray like that, so that you can see it. Difficulty level, so there are three different difficulty levels in the game, the simplified, standard, and the seasons, seasoned. We are gonna be using the standard difficulty level for this tutorial, uh, which will impact some of the upcoming steps. So, yeah. But basically there are three different difficulty levels of the game which is good right corporation so the mission that we chose tells us which corporation we're going to be playing against we chose the mission which means we're playing against need chain so we take this now this is unfortunately a little bit shiny uh, which is why it's reflecting a little bit from the overhead lights this is darker in person uh, but because it's got this plastic sheen to it it is reflecting the light a little bit but basically what we've got is this is the threat track is this the threat track? It's a threat card. It's a very big card, but this is the corporation's threat card. Um, and it says place it to the left of the network mat, but it doesn't actually matter. But there are two sides. This is the simplified side, so we don't want that side. We actually want this side. This is the standard side. So if we were playing the simplified version of the game, we'd use that side. And as you can see, there's a lot less stuff on it. So that's gonna go there. Um, place two of the red beads at the top of the card. Okay, so they are going to go there. Uh, one of those is going to track the current threat level, and the other bead uh, is going to track the highest event or escalation that our threat has reached so far. So basically, from what I remember of the rules, threat can go up or down, but once you've reached a particular threat level and something's happened, you need to mark that to say this has happened, which means when threat goes back down again, if it comes back up, it doesn't trigger it again. That's from what I remember of the rules. I know that kept changing a few times. So we will, um, yeah, we'll, we'll see as we read through it that that is still the same. Right, the next thing is we need to go over to the network mat and we need to find the CEO for need chain, which is Bo Zephyrs. Is that always the CEO for need chain? Let me have a look. Because there's three CEOs. Yeah, it is. So Bo Zephyrs is the CEO for Need Chain. So whenever you're playing against Need Chain, you want to put Bo Zephyrs here. Uh, and basically, that, that's the CEO. That goes at the centre of the network. Like that. Right. What's next? What is next? 
Um, two red bees at the top of the threat card. Done that, done that, done that. Right, next page. Network. Okay, so while we're on the network, uh, place the CEO, red CEO network level die set to one, which is this. So this is the red CEO's dice. That says that goes to network level one. That goes in there. Place the network level die of the first player's colour set to one in the die cut at the top right of the network. Yeah, okay, so each player has their own die. Um, so the yellow player is the first player, so that's going to go in there. And then all other players in clockwise order go into the other one. So because we're playing a two-player game today, we just fill the, the first two slots. We don't need to fill those. And we also need um, a peg, I believe. Yeah, so there's an IP peg. So we take one peg from each player and we put it in the little hole right next to the die. Uh, and that is an IP peg. So we have a ping peg, which is the, the red one, and an IP peg, which is the player one. Right, the next thing that we do is we choose a captain. So there are, how many captains have I got? There are six different captains included in the game. You will pick one of them at random, but for this tutorial, we're going to be playing against Crucible. Right, so this is Crucible. Uh, find his captain card and place it at the back of the card tray for easy reference. So the captains, each of the captains has a card associated with them. Uh, and this is the card for Crucible, which is two-sided. So we have some flavor text on this side and we have some rules stuff on the other side. For now, I'm just going to slot that into there. And then we do the floor plan. Okay, so this is where we need to refer to the floor plan book. And let's just press another button for the map here. Okay, let's get this out of the way. So the game comes with the floor plan book, which has basically got the floor plans for each of the uh, corporations and each of the floors. Uh, now, this is always the same. So whenever you're playing against Need Chain, it's always that for level one, that for level two, and that for level three. And that is because this is Need Chain's headquarters. Okay, so every mission that you play against Need Chain is obviously it's using the same building, so it's the same layout. Um, but the layout is different for the three floors. We then have Ocularity, Salida, and Biodefend is the expansion one. Um, but they've put that in this so that it's all in one place. So what we're going to be doing is we are going to be setting up floor one of Need Chain. And the reason why I took those pieces off the board earlier on is this is really cool. This is a neoprene mat, uh, and these are thin neoprene pieces. So basically, you've got neoprene on neoprene, which means it doesn't slide anywhere. Um, yeah, so it's a really, really clever idea. And chip theory games are obviously famous for using neoprene. So we basically need to build the board like so. Uh, each of these buildings has a name on it, so you can help find it. Um, or you can look at the artwork, whichever. Uh, one, two, three, four, that goes there. And uh, I love maps. I've always loved maps. So this part is really, really... <laughs> really enjoyable making maps. What have we got here? This is storage. Storage is... I think it's in the top right. Yep, there we go. There's storage. Security is over here. There you go. Uh, service elevator. While I'm doing this, I just wanted to say uh, another thing. For those of you that are watching this video, um, a, a, a big thank you because basically all of my advertising revenue right now uh, is going to the Ukraine charities. So it's going to the Disasters Emergency Committee. So by watching this video and getting the adverts, you've helped raise a little bit of money for, for charity. So yeah, thank you very much for watching this video. All of my advertising revenue goes to charity and it, it always has done. But right now, it's all going to the uh, to the DEC in Ukraine. Not quite the twelve million that was raised in the in the, uh, the the concert the other night, but um, it's still a, it's still a quite a bit of money that we're raising. So yeah, big thank you to everybody. Right. So that's that done. That's the floor plan done. The next thing to do is terminals. We need to set up terminals, caches, and surveillance beads. So basically. Uh, everywhere on the map with a terminal icon, which is this, we need to place a terminal chip. The terminal chips are two-sided, uh, mainframe side on that side and terminal side on that side. So we need to place them terminal side up. 
and it actually tells you in the book how many there are. So seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Excellent. Right. Okay. We do exactly the same with the cash chips, which have got uh, the cash on one side and a key on the other side. So let's see if I can find these. There's one. Oh, should be cash side up. There's one. There's one. There's one. There's one. I'm counting four. And the book says six. So I've missed some. There's one. Two, three, four, five. There. Six. Okay. And then surveillance beads. So basically, these white beads are surveillance beads. And what you do is you put one of these in each room that shows one or more surveillance die icons in its info bar. So every room has a name. And if there's, a, if there's one or more die icons in the info bar, it means there might be something in there. So you need to put a surveillance uh, bead in the room to remind you to do something. So we need one in there. Even though there's two icons here, we only put one bead. Put one bead in there. But here there is no icons. There's no icons in the equipment room, so we don't need to put a bead in there. We need to put one in there. And we need to put, I'm guessing we put one in here. Yes, we put one in here as well. Okay, so they're just a reminder that when you go into those rooms, you need to surveil. I don't know if you can see them. Yeah, that's the problem with the clear beads. You might not be able to see them that well. Um, no, no, most of them are showing up, just this one. Okay, right, next. Um, terminals, caches, surveillance beads to the room. We've done that. Okay, next, hallway security. So if you look at the board, you will see that there are these icons here. We've got one, we've got two, and we've got three. This is known as hallway security. They are the hallway security posts. And the captain's card tells you for floor one, with Crucible as the captain, who seems to have lots of blades, stick, circular stores, saws sticking out of his head. That can't be comfortable. That really can't be comfortable. Um, anyway, this is where things start. So if you look here, we don't have anything on two, but on floor one, we have a level one guard with a key. Uh, not floor one, on, on, uh, on hallway security post number one, we have a level one guard with a key. And hallway security post number three, we have a level one guard without a key. So what you would normally do is you would normally uh, draw a level one guard at random, but for this, it is fixed. We're going to put a level one hamster. So where's the hamster? Hamster, hamster, hamster. It's going to go there. Um, and a walker on uh, three. So we don't have anything on two. But we have that on there. Now, facing is very important in this game. So if you look carefully here, there is a tiny little arrow. Basically, it means it's pointing this way. So what you do is you put that on there so that it is pointing that way. So yeah, facing is very important in this game. That's going to go on there. And remember, this one has a key. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a key underneath there like so. I'll slightly offset it just so that you can uh, just so you can see. We do have... We do have the side camera uh, for when we need to see things. So you can see here, it's there, it's got, a, it's got a key underneath it. Okay, right, what's next? That's the hallway security posts done. That card can go back over there. Um, we've done the key. If there is more than one hallway security post with the same number, place a security unit of the appropriate level on each number. Okay, so we could have had two number ones on the board. Uh, and if we did have two number ones, we would put guards on each one. Right, next. Um, we've done that, we've done that, we've done that. Mandatory security posts in the rooms. Okay, so some of the rooms have... No, it's not that, it's the star. So if there's a star inside the shield, that means it is a mandatory security post. Um, and the floor plan book tells us that there is one mandatory guard. So this is really good so that you don't miss anything. So we know that there's one mandatory guard and we've seen it, it's there. So what we do is we draw another guard and this time you draw it equal to the level of the floor. We're on floor one, so this is another level one guard. But again, for this tutorial, it's fixed. It's gonna be Bulldog. Bulldog. Now Bulldog is actually facing that way because it's sat at the desk, presumably, and it's doing stuff. So Bulldog is gonna go there. Right. 
Um, yeah, we're done. Right, next page. Agents. So finally, we get round to the part of the game where we get to choose which of the bots that we are. So terminology is important here. These three things are all bots. Oh, I don't know where we put the captains. The captain's chip, I think, goes back. These three things are all bots, but these two are agents. So you have agents, one of which, one per player, and you have the command module as well. So the command module is not an agent. The command module is a bot. So what we do is each player chooses a bot. Now, there are how many different bots included in the game? I think there's like eight, something. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There are ten bots included in the game, okay? And each player chooses which bot they want to play. There is a recommendation for a quicker starting game that you shuffle them, pick two for a per player, and then each player chooses which one they want to play between the two, because otherwise your choice could be It'd be overwhelming looking at all of these. Um, for the tutorial, the yellow player is going to be playing Bite. Okay, and the purple player is going to be playing Access. So we need those out. Uh, and then as a team, you choose one of the remaining ones, or again, if you want to shuffle, pick two at random and choose one, to represent the command module. And for this tutorial, we're going to be playing with Bit as the command module. So these cards here, let me just show you the command module. These cards are two-sided. You will use that side of the card if it's an agent, or you will use that side of the card if it's a command module. So this is the command module, and what happens is it basically slots into there. Um, and what happens is because this is a neoprene mat, once you've slotted it in position, it doesn't really move. So, yeah. I missed placing the little entrance tile above security. Okay, thank you. I missed a bit. Entrance tile above security. Where did I miss? Where did I miss? Entrance tile above security. Nine. Entrance tile. Oh, I missed that. Right, okay. I need to find that. So yes, there is another tile which I haven't put on the board. Oh, it's that one. Thank you very much for spotting it. So there's an entrance tile which goes there. Okay. Now, you can still get in here, can't you? Uh, presumably, you can still get in here as well as there. So there's a security entrance here and there's an entrance here. Okay, so yeah, there's this little entrance tile that I missed. There you go. Thank you very much for spotting that. Right, where are we? Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Yeah, command module, so we've done that. Um, yeah, each player places their chosen bot card. So, all right, so we've got, this is, this is going to be the yellow one. So we're going to take that out of the way. So what we're going to do is we're going to slide this underneath here. Like so. And then we're going to slide this one underneath here. So these are our two agents for this particular mission. Um, right, let's go back to yellow. Take the matching bot chip and awareness chip for the command... Uh, oh no, hang on. Um, Take the bot chip and awareness chip, match in your agent, and place them near your map. Right, so we need to go through the mats. And this is the bot chip and the awareness chip for, for bite. So I'll just put them there for now. And then we also need to do the same for access. So this is access's chip and access's uh, awareness chip. And for the command module, we need um, bit. So this is bits. Uh, bits chip bot chip bits bot chip and bits awareness chip right okay <laughs> terminology uh, some of the agents might have special dice or other stuff but these these don't have them right okay so for the command module back to the command module place a peg in the hole above each burn cycle slot that lines up with the green icon on the command modules card so basically we have five potential slots in the burn cycle, which is here, and two of them start off open. So what we do is we take these pegs here, that one in there, and that one in there. The more of these you have open, the better. Um, so that's that. Use a peg to set the command module's current power to match its starting power level. So command module starting power level is six, so we're gonna put a little peg in there on number six. 
Uh, did I need to do the same for the agents? No. No, I don't think I needed to do the same for the agents. We've done that, we've done that, we've done that. Right, okay, next. The reserve allotment. So the reserve allotment is basically, uh, let, let's have a look at bytes. So all agents start off with at least one chip in their what's called a reserve allotment. I remember finding the right term for this was quite tricky. But based on the number of players in the game, you might have extra. So if you were playing a solo game and you were just playing one agent, you would actually start off with all of these three. So you would put pegs in each of these and you would start off with everything unlocked. In a two player game, you get one of them of your choice, which for byte doesn't matter because they're all the same. Uh, and in a three and four player game, you don't get any additional ones. OK, so what we do and it says you don't take the chips yet because we're going to be doing that later on. But since this is a two player game, both access and byte get to choose one of these three things uh, to have. So obviously it doesn't matter for byte because they're all blue. But for access, the tutorial is telling us that we want one of the green ones, um, which is a tech chip. So green is tech. OK, right. Next. I'm not going to be playing all three floors. In fact, I am going to be, I, I, I've got to finish this at about 4.30 today because I've got, uh, I've got another live unboxing that I'm doing at five o'clock. So at 4.30 today, UK time, uh, we're going to have to be calling the video quits. But to be honest, uh, I'll probably end it at, at a suitable time. I might just end it after the first floor. Uh, yeah, we'll see how we get on. Okay, routing power is the next thing to do. So all agents start with 10 power in their power bank. So we take a peg and we put it in the number 10 spot. It goes on there. Uh, and now players may simultaneously route or spend power to gain upgrades until they are at or below their power bank limit. So basically the way this works is at the start of the game, if you have a look, uh, Byte currently has 10 power but has a power limit of 4. So before the game even starts, Byte needs to spend 6 power to basically buy upgrades. Access is slightly different. Access has a power limit of 8, so Access only needs to spend 2 power. Now you can spend more power um, if, you, if you want to, but you've got to spend some because otherwise you lose it. And basically what this means is you get to do character upgrades before the game even starts. Now, when you first play the game, you won't have the faintest idea. OK, so this tutorial is actually suggesting which ones we should go with, but it is ve is very cool in the way that you get to customise your character before the game starts. But as I say, when you're learning the game and you really haven't got the faintest idea what to do, my advice is don't agonise about the decision. Just make a decision. Don't worry too much about it. Play your first game. If it all goes wrong, make a different decision next time. Um, for me, anyway, the first few times I play a game is always really a learning game. If you're one of those people that wants to be ultra competitive from game one, that's absolutely fine. But you've got to be aware that you might end up spending 20 minutes making a decision when you don't actually fully understand the implications, implementations, implications of that decision. So personal advice, make a decision, get on, play fast and then put it away and start again. Anyway, right. So what it's suggesting for this setup is Byte is going to spend two power and it's going to gain the silent entry ability. So each of the agents has three special abilities that you can unlock. Silent en entry is going to cost two, keen eye is going to cost two, and distortion cloak is going to cost three. Uh, and it's recommending that we go for silent entry. So we've routed two power and we've got that. Also going to route another two power to buy an advanced die. So each advanced die costs two power. So what we do is we're going to put a little peg in there. This, by the way, here is a maximum limit. So Byte cannot have more than two advanced dice and no more than four elite dice. So these, these here are a limit. Um, OK, so we've done that. Now, also, the team wants to unlock this third burn cycle slot. Now, to do that is going to require spending three power, which is spent collectively between the agents involved in the mission. So the tutorial is saying that uh, Byte spends two power. So Byte is going to spend another two power down to four. Uh, and Access is going to spend one power 
And what that does is that unlocks this third burn cycle slot here. Okay. Um, right, now over to access. Access is going to spend two power to buy an advanced die. And that is it. So access has a power limit of eight and is currently down to seven. Whereas Byte has got a power limit of four and is currently on four. As I said, you could spend more if you wanted to, but that's what the tutorial is telling us to do. Yeah, implementations is now a, is now a word. Absolutely, I do just make up random words. Okay, burn cycle. We now need to create the burn cycle itself, which is what the game's about, um, or what the game's called anyway. And way we do, the way we do that is with the drawback of ultimate power. That's what mine's called anyway. Um, and what you do is you take the captain's ship, which is this one, and you take a number, a number, oh, I don't know what's up with me today with my words, lack of sleep. You take a number of generic chips to make the total up to the number of burn cycle slots. So we have three burn cycle slots. So you always want one captain's chip and then you want two generic chips because we've got three. If we didn't unlock that, we would basically have one of each. But because we've unlocked that, we get a total of three. You put these in the bag, you shuffle them, and then you lay them out here at random. For the tutorial, we're going to do that. Okay, now these chips are two-sided. Make sure you don't use the degraded side when you set it up. Right. And we need a red bead to act as the burn cycle tracker. So I can put that down there for now. Yeah, so instead of randomizing them, do that, do that, do that. Right, okay, next, starting spaces. Players now choose where they want to start on the board, and you can start on any of the outer spaces. Basically, the, gr the dark grey is the pavement outside the building, or the sidewalk. Um, and players place their agent chip on the outdoor space of their choice, one bot per space. And then as a team, you decide where the command module is going. Now, for this particular tutorial, it is suggesting that access goes up here. Um, byte is going to go here, and bit is going to go here. Okay, and then what we do is we create the team's reserve. That's Loki scratching at a door. Loki, don't know why he's scratching at a door. You can hear that I'm in here, and he's already been in once to see me. Hello. Um, so for each outdoor space that a bot occupies that depicts an action icon, you get the matching action chip in the, in the team's reserve. So I think, and this is more of a question for the development team or the, uh, or the play testers, is why wouldn't you start on these? Because you can start any way you want, but if you start here, you don't get any things at the start. Um, so I, th I think it, it very strongly encourages you to start on these spaces. So we basically get a blue chip, which is utility, a green chip, which is tech, and we get a physical chip as well. And what happens is we take one of each of those chips. You know, if you've played this scenario properly and you haven't started on those spaces, how has it worked out for you? So these are the three chips uh, that we've got in there. You can just see them above the command module map. So that is called the team's reserve. In fact, I'm just going to move that down a little bit. There we go. Okay, so that's the team's reserve. Um, and it does say in some missions, the bots actually start in a room instead of outside. In this case, you will place chips into the team's reserve based on the icons in the info bar of the room. Okay, right. Now we do agent reserves. So at this point, each, each of our agents has its own reserves, which is basically equal to what's shown on here. So Byte is going to start with a physical and a utility. Now, where do these go? Here. Okay, so physical and utility. And access is going to get a physical and a tech. Physical and tech. Not physical and tech, utility and tech. Colours are important, Paul. Right. Uh, access does the same with the utility and tech that she is allotted. Right, okay, got it. Um, the final bit of setup is each agent gets an imperative card. So as I mentioned, you would normally shuffle these and you would deal each one, uh, you deal one to each agent, 
But for this particular tutorial mission, it is fixed. Uh, so byte gets remote jammer, which goes here. Um, and access has got troll sequence, which goes there. Okay, setup is complete. So that is it. That is the end of setup. Am I going to play through the whole mission or just the written tutorial in the book? I, I'm going to read through this book as much as I can until I have to disappear at 4.30. So yeah, we'll, we'll get through as much as we can today. If I finish before then, we finish before then. But, but my plan today is just to go through this book for now. Um, and yeah, we'll see how we get on. Right, off we go then. There's going to be lots of reading from now on. That's the bit that I did the other night. Uh, but I wanted to go through that again just to show you what it's going to be like when you get this game. Because, yeah, if you follow through this process, then that's what you're going to do. And I would strongly recommend it. I do know a few people that go, oh, no, I'm a serious gamer. I don't need no stinking tutorials. I'm just going to jump into the main game. And that's fine. If they want to do that and sit there for 12 hours struggling with learning the game, that's fine. For me, learn to play booklets, absolutely brilliant. This, this for me, as I say, is absolutely the best way of learning a game. Right, Burn Cycle Basics. Are we ready? Are we all sitting comfortably? Because, <laughs> yeah, there's going to be a lot of reading. Plan ahead. In any, as in any heist, successfully overthrowing a corporation in Burn Cycle requires careful planning. Before starting the game, it is recommended that players familiarise themselves with the following in order to properly prepare for the task ahead. The mission card and its objectives. So this, we need to know what it is that we're actually trying to do. The threat card, which is this here. So we, we ideally, when you know the game properly, you should be looking at this because all of this stuff is going to happen at some point and you need to be aware of it. The captain's card. So you need to know what abilities the captain has so that you can prepare for it. The captain's chip, which we've put back in the tray for now, but the captain has a chip with some stats on it. Um, in fact, I'm going to put that over there. Each team member's bot card to make sure you know what each team member can do and the command module and the floor plans for all floors of the corporation. So you are allowed to know ahead of time what floors two and three are going to be like because you've got, you've, you've got blueprints and you've got access to this information. So you would know what floors two and three look like. So you can do quite a bit of planning ahead in this game. Um, at the very least, it's a good idea to look ahead at where the safe zones are on each floor. Yeah, safe zones are really important. That's the yellow bordered areas. Um, decision making. As it's a cooperative game, your team will need to work together to win. At various times, your team will be presented with opportunities to make decisions as a group. I think I wrote this bit. There's a lot of this rule book that I wrote and, I, and I'm reading it now and I'm thinking, that sounds like something I wrote. Um, and you might, you might be thinking, well, hang on a minute, Paul. If you wrote this rule book, then how don't you know how to play? It was many, many, many months ago, and I didn't. Uh, I was involved in the rule book, but I didn't see the whole process right through to the end. So I know that a number of changes were made, and yet yeah, it's been it's been such a long time. I don't remember that much about it, but I do remember writing that bit. Anyway, uh, you've got to make decisions as a group. If consensus between all team members cannot be reached, then either take a quick vote, or in case of a tie, decide randomly. Yeah, I definitely read that bit. Okay, there will be many times in this game where individuals will need to make decisions or use resources that affect the rest of the team. Decisions made on your own turn are yours to make and do not require the approval of your team members. Right, here are additional burn cycle basics that are important for you to understand. Movement and the general positioning of things in relation to each other is always counted orthogonally. So in this game, there is no such thing as diagonal adjacency or diagonal anything. Everything is all left, right, up, down. Uh, the word may is used to indicate that an ability or an effect is optional. If a game effect does not contain may, it is not optional and it must be carried out if possible. If part or all of a game effect cannot be carried out, carry out as much of it as possible and ignore the rest. Okay, there's no hidden information between players, so feel free to keep any of your cards face up and allow your other players, uh, other players to read them. And if a card text conflicts with the game rules, the card text takes precedence. Right, okay, got it. Next up, introducing the units. 
There are several types of units in the game and you will need to understand the difference between them to follow these rules. So your team consists of bots. There are two types of bots, agents and the command module. Agents are the bots that the players have control over, specifically not the command module. And the command module is also a bot, but is not an agent. Very important part of the team as it houses the command plans for your mission and also has the programming for your team's burn cycle. Unfortunately, because so much of its internal coding is removed in order to store this important programming, it has no autonomy and does not take its own turns. It depends on the agents to keep it safe and also give it actions in order to function. Uh, oh, and it did say somewhere earlier on that if the, uh, if the command module ever gets shut down during the mission, it's game over. You lose straight away. The corporation also has a team of units collectively called security units. Their job is to keep an eye on the building and ensure troublemakers such as yourselves are found and taken care of. If they notice you milling about the corporation, they will chase you down or radio one of their counterparts to investigate. And there are two types of security units. There are guards and captains. Uh, mech donning guards, so these are humans in mech suits. Um, these are generally found in the hallways of every floor of the corporation and can also be discovered inside many of the rooms. The term guard specifically excludes the captain. The captain is often found on the final floor of the mission. Captains have unique abilities and are generally tougher to deal with than guards, so they are best avoided when possible. Yes, unlike uh, other chip theory games, games, uh, this is not a combat orientated game. Too Many Bones, uh, Cloud Spire, they are very combat heavy and lots and lots of fighting. This is an infiltration game. You generally speaking want to avoid combat in this particular game. It isn't about going in and beating up the bad guys. It's about avoiding the bad guys. Right, introducing the board. Okay, so lots of information that we're going to need during the game. Much of the, burn cycle, much of the burn cycle is played on the corporation mat, also referred to as the board. The board is made up of squares called spaces. Bots and security units will move around the board on their turn. We have the outdoor spaces, which represent the area outside the corporation. In general, bots start on these spaces and they can only be moved on to floor one. So when we go to floor two, you cannot go onto the dark grey spaces because that's like outside and you fall down and die, I guess. Hallway spaces are the light grey ones. This represents the hallways of the corporation. Uh, since security units generally patrol the hallways, it's important to be careful when moving around them. Room spaces. So any space in a room is a room space. Rooms are enclosed by walls, separating them from the hallways and other rooms. And rooms can contain caches, terminals, and or security units. Bots will often need to enter specific rooms to complete their mission. Let me just remind ourselves what the mission is. Floor one, one bot has to access a terminal. Right, so we know what our objective is for floor one, is one of our bots has to access one of these terminals. Right, safe zones, outlined in yellow. The spaces that bots must end their turn on in order to finish a floor and move to the next after finishing their objective. So we need to finish the objective and then all bots must get to a safe, a safe zone. Safe zones are generally safer than other areas because security units never see bots go through safe zone doors. Okay. Hiding spots. Let's have a look at the map actually. Uh, hiding spots are spaces that protect bots from being detected. So hiding spots are these. Anything with the blue I crossed out icon, that icon. So these two here are hiding spots. There's a hiding spot. In fact, there's quite a few. Yeah, there's lots of hiding spots there. Okay, can't hide in the toilet. Um, as long as a bot stays on a hiding spot, security will not be aware of them. Okay, next we have doors. So these triple red arrows, these are doors. Doors are all considered locked by default and bots must unlock them to move through them. Two doors that line up with each other are treated like a single door. So here, this is one door. It's not two doors, it's just one door. We have cache spaces, which is these. Uh, it's a space where a cache chip is placed during setup. If a cache chip is not on this space, it has no effect. Okay, okay, so when that's gone, that space has no effect. And the terminals is exactly the same. 
if the terminal is not if the terminal chip is not there it has no effect but that's where the terminal is placed we also have objective spaces so the magenta spaces are objective spaces these have no innate effect and can be ignored unless called out on the mission card okay so for this floor we can ignore those uh, those things and then we have security posts so we have these so we have a letter a there we have a b we have one without any letters but these i believe are security posts these represent spaces that security units either start on or may spawn on yeah so we have numbers we have letters and we have blank ones okay right there we go that's that's the board that's everything we need to know about the board next oh i'm getting quite um sore throat it's all right we'll be doing in five minutes <clears throat> introducing imperatives right so remember each of our bots each of our agents drew an imperative at the start of the game let's just have a look at this one these represent programming protocols given to the agents by the corporation they are hindrances but they grant power if successfully completed each agent starts the game with an imperative card and they get new imperatives when changing floors and occasionally from entering rooms or from other game effects. The command module cannot have imperatives and agents can never have more than one imperative each and ignore drawing one if they already have one. Okay, so if Byte was to draw another imperative, we would ignore it. An imperative card can be disregarded. However, if an agent disobeys their imperative card, they must discard their imperative card and lose one power. Similarly, they also lose one power if they choose to discard the imperative without fulfilling it. If an agent successfully fills their, fulfills their imperative, they discard the card and gain the amount of power showing in the card's bottom right corner. Okay, I need to read that again. So let's have a look at Remote Jammer. The next time your agent takes a terminal action, you must not be on a tech chip in the burn cycle. Okay, and what this is saying is that I can choose to ignore that if I want to, but if I do, I discard it and lose one power. But if I complete it, I gain one power. Okay, let's have a look at what access is. is. Troll sequence. The next time your agent takes an optimised physical action, you do not get the optimised benefit. Okay, so if you, if you do that, you get a power but you could choose to just ignore it. I think that's what that means. Right, next, flow of the game. And again, we do have player reference cards that actually summarize this for us. So, a game of burn cycle is broken into rounds. A game can consist of any number of rounds. In a round, each player will take a turn, starting with the first player and going clockwise. Then the corporation will take a turn. So in a two player game, it's player one, player two, and then the corporation. After the corporation's turn, we start another round. A player turn, I'm just gonna zoom in on, on this. Here you go, here's the reference card. So this is what you do on a, on a turn. Uh, root power, build your dice pool, take actions, navigate the network, root power again, and then degrade the burn cycle. And the tutorial is basically saying, let's jump into the first turn of the game. Since Byte is the first player, it will be her first turn. We'll lead with some information about each of the steps of your turn and then follow it up with instructions on what Byte does. Make sure you read everything to get a full understanding of the game. Right, then we have a little box about what is power. So power represents three things. It represents the bot's health. So if you ever go to zero power, the bot is shut down. It's also a currency that you can use to spend on upgrades, which, you, which is what we saw earlier on. And for agents, it also determines how many basic action dice you can roll on the turn. So Byte, on her turn, gets to roll four basic action dice. Uh, the bot's current power is reflected with a peg in the track. This is their power bank. And while power banks can hold up to 10 power, each agent has a power bank limit, which is there, which is the maximum power they can store at the end of their turn. So you can go above four, but then at the end of the turn goes back down to four. Uh, command modules do not have to abide by the power bank limit. Ah, except of course, except for ten maximum. 
So, ah, so command modules are different. This is how much power the command module starts with, but they can go above this, so it, it doesn't act as a limit. Right, okay, next. Routing power. So the first step of a player's turn is root power. As the first step of your turn, you may root or spend power. Uh, it, it's root, comma, or spend, comma. So I think it's basically just saying routing is like spending power to activate upgrades on your agent or on the command module. Unless otherwise stated, upgrades can be gained in any order. This step is optional, uh, as your power bank limit is not applied until the root power step at the end of your turn. So basically, if you've got over your power at this point, you're not gonna have to drop down until later on in the turn. Okay. So agent upgrades, things that you can buy for your character. You can buy dice upgrades, specialized abilities, reserve allotment, and universal abilities. Ah, these are the universal abilities. Right. So action dice. We have a section about action dice. Um, each agent builds a dice pool at the start of their turn, and these dice are rolled any time the agent needs to make an AP check. AP checks are required for several of the actions bots can take. Some AP checks require a minimum result for success, while others allow you to roll any amount of AP and make use of the AP roll. When making an AP check, you may roll as many dice from your dice pool as you want to, including zero, and then total the result. Three types of dice, basic, advanced, and elite. So, base, so what happens is, whenever Byte creates her dice pool, it's four blue and one yellow. And the yellow dice are better than the blue dice, and the red dice are better than the yellow dice. Okay, um, and the, so the blue dice have blank sides, and if you roll two blanks, you can combine them together to make one AP. Right, okay. Oh, and there's some re-rolls as well. The elite dice have re-rolls on them. So, you can root power to gain more reliable and effective dice that will be available on your turn. Advanced dice cost two power, Elite dice cost four power or two power and an advanced dice. So you can upgrade an advanced to an elite for two power. Okay. Uh, I mentioned that these are your limits. Yep. Then we have agent abilities. Each agent has a unique innate ability. Oh, you've got a unique innate ability. So we have an, an innate ability at the start of the game. Um, and then you've got specialized abilities which you can activate in order to use. It costs you a certain amount of power, you put the peg in there. Okay. We also have a reserve. Agents have their own reserve set of action ships that can only be used by them. But remember, we also have the team's reserve, which is these three here. Uh, reserves consist of physical tech and or utility chips that can be used in a couple of ways. One, altering the burn cycle. So if you want to alter the burn cycle, you must have a reserve chip to place in the burn cycle to alter it. More details later. And resolving input on keypads. Now, I'm assuming we'll get to that later on. But many keypads have physical tech and or utility inputs. And you can discard matching chips from your reserve or the team's reserve to meet those requirements. More details later. Uh, and yeah, each agent has a reserve allotment at the bottom. And basically, the more pegs you put in here, the more chips you're going to get. Um... And this is what we started with, but there is, a, I think, whenever you reboot the burn cycle, I think you refill back to this. We'll get to that later on. We also have three universal abilities. These are the same for all bots, which you can buy these upgrades for one energy each, which allows you to um, swap spaces with other bots by moving into their space, because normally you can't do that. Push, you can spend one action point um, to push a bot out of the way, and then another action point to move on to their space. Uh, and repair. So you, with, with this, you can transfer some of your power to another bot. The command module upgrades. These can be activated during the root power steps of any player's turn, and the power routed to them can come from any bot or combination of bots. So there are universal abilities. So it's the same three universal abilities here. Um, there are burn cycle slots, which we've seen. You can upgrade, and I think that's it. Yeah. So what is the burn cycle? The corporation has stolen the bot's higher functions in their attempt to repress them. The burn cycle is the bot's solution to this, a strategic coding protocol which allows the bots to get around this and even increase their effectiveness through action type synchronicity. 
There you go. I'm sure it will be explained later on. Uh, but the burn cycle is a crucial part of the game as it is used for taking actions in the physical world and for navigating the network. Each chip in the burn cycle grants the agents an action on their turn. Agents will work through the burn cycle from left to right, uh, taking actions or passing for each chip. Special action chips, so these are generic ones, but if it was a special one, then it grants you a benefit if the action type taken matches the chip it is taken on. Meanwhile, the corporation's captain will also affect the code of your burn cycle, and the bots will have to deal with negative ramifications whenever the captain's chip comes up. Each burn cycle chip also grants movement on the network, with special action chips allowing for more dynamic movement than general chips. At the end of each player's turn, one of the chips in the burn cycle will degrade, leaving the next player with one fewer action. To combat this, agents can alter the burn cycle, replacing action chips in the code with fresh ones to keep going as long as possible without rebooting, or the burn cycle can be rebooted before the start of any player's turn, resetting it, but this causes threat to advance and also the burn cycle to a, returns to a more basic state. Right, okay, lots of information. Oof. Burn cycle slots. My cup of tea's gone cold. Ugh. The burn cycle starts with only some of its slots activated. The team must upgrade the burn cycle if they want to activate additional slots. Burn cycle slots must be activated from left to right, so you cannot... You cannot activate that one until you've activated this one. After spending the power outlined on the command modules card for the slot, you put a peg in the hole and you place a general action ship on the slot. Remember, this power can come from a combination of bots. All of these upgrade options are enticing, but remember a bot's power also acts as its health and influences its dice pool. You'll need to find the balance between getting worthwhile upgrades and keeping enough power in the bank. It's a resource management game, with power being the most important resource. On the flip side, you should also remember that any power gained above 10 is lost, so don't keep too much of it, or you may end up with wasted power. Right, so for the tutorial, it says, Byte is taking the first turn, and Byte has the chance now to root power. However, the first root power step of the game is seldom used, because agents uh, had the chance to root power during setup. But here... If you'd forgotten to root power during setup, excuse me, now now's the time you can do it. Okay, next, what is a dice pool? <laughs> We've already introduced to you the concept of action dice. Your dice pool contains all the action, oh, wrong view, uh, contains all the action dice available to you on your turn. You build it by looking at your power bank and dice upgrades. You'll get one basic action die for each power in your power bank, and you'll gain elite, uh, advanced and elite action dice based on how many upgrades you've activated. Once dice are rolled on your turn, they are used and returned to the supply, regardless of whether they are needed for the AP check. The exception to this is blanks. These are returned to your dice pool and are available to gain on a future action, unless you combine two blanks to use. Right, okay. So once you use your, once you roll your dice, they're gone. Right. Rationing out your action dice for your actions during your turn is an important part of the game. Don't worry about being too sparing with your action dice, though though, any left at the end of your turn are wasted and you'll really build your dice pool. Right, okay. So step two, build your dice pool. For each power in your power bank, add basic action dice to your dice pool. So let's do it. Byte gets four basic action dice and one advanced action dice. Done. Uh, we'd like to line our dice up above our agent mats, but you can place your dice anywhere, as long as it doesn't get mixed up with other dice around the table. Yeah, I think I'm just going to pop it... Well, I could put it below. I could absolutely put it below. Because you can still see it, can't you? Yeah, so four blue and one yellow. There we go. Right, Byte has four power in her power bank, so she gets four basic action dice and another... Yeah, okay, got it. Next. Step three, take actions. Actions are managed through the burn cycle. This. Um, each active action chip gives the opportunity to take an action. But if it was degraded, 
you would skip it. So a degraded action chip is not active and it is skipped. Okay, so the flow of the action step is place the burn cycle tracker under the leftmost active action chip in the burn cycle. I might just put it on. No, I'm going to put it below because it says below. Right, so that goes there. Let's, let's just zoom in on this. So place, place the burn cycle tracker under the leftmost active action chip in the burn cycle. If that chip is the captain action chip, carry out the text in the burn cycle action section of the captain's card. Right, we're not there yet. Step three, take an action or pass. Then move the burn cycle tracker to the next active action chip and repeat, resolving the captain action chip if it comes up and then taking an action or passing. Continue until you have either taken an action or passed for each active chip. And at the end of your action step, return any unused action dice you have to the supply. You will not need them for the remainder of your turn and you will build a new dice pool on your turn. Right. Important. You can take any available action on any active action chip. However, there are three special action types in this game, physical, tech and utility, and chips of these types will gradually end up in your burn cycle. If you take an action of the type that matches the chip you took an action on, the action is optimised. Optimising an action grants you a benefit or makes it easier to succeed. Right, so tutorial. There are several action options in this game and out of context their details can seem a little daunting at first. Yeah, you're not kidding. But worry not, this tutorial will take you through examples of each of them. Uh, so for the purposes of this tutorial we recommend just reading the action tiles and descriptions to get a feel for everything you will be able to do. Then when the tutorial has you take one of these actions, come back and read it. Okay, so basically we've got a lot more reading in the rule book, but what it is suggesting is that we actually don't read this at this moment, but when the tutorial tells us to take this action, then we come back and do it. That's good because we've got a whole thing about awareness, we've got a whole thing about physical actions, lots of different physical actions, all of the utility actions, and I don't want to read all of these now. I just want to be told which action I want to do. So I'm going to skip all of that. Yeah, I'm going to skip all of it for now. And we're just going to jump ahead to this. Now that you have an overview of the actions available, well, I've kind of skipped it. Let's work through the action step of Byte's turn because I want to start doing stuff now. Our first order of business is getting into the corporation. So action number one, here we go. Are we all ready? Do we still have people watching? <laughs> We're actually gonna start playing. So action number one, place the burn cycle tracker under the first burn cycle chip, done. Byte will choose movement for her first action. So we've done, we've done a dice pool, we're now doing actions, and we're choosing the move action. Now the move action is a physical action. So physical actions, we have movement, the most used action in the game. You roll an AP check, and if the action is optimized, you add two AP. So basically we choose, I think, how many dice we want to roll, and that tells us how many movement points we get. It's a roll and move game. Um, and there are various things we can do during movement. Let's see what it says. Before resolving this roll, Byte has the chance to use her ability Tumble Magnet. Okay, let's have a look. Tumble Magnet. When taking any action, Byte may change the result of one rolled action die to match the result of another rolled action die before resolving her roll. Okay. Ah, it says here, Byte will, Byte will move. She decides to roll two basic action die. Okay, so we're rolling and we roll two basic action die and we get that. We get a blank and we get a two. Okay, again, it's, it's a scripted tutorial. So that's going to give us two movement points, but we now have the ability to use Tumble Magnet. So and this is free to use. So I can change the result of one rolled action die to match the result of another rolled action die before resolving the roll. So I turn that into that and I've got four movement points. Yeah, okay, so we have four movement points to spend. So Byte is going to move. This is Byte. Now these don't have facing. 
or do they? Because there's no little arrows on these. So I don't think that agents have facing. I think that's only for the for the security guards. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to move. And it says bike moves two spaces to the left. Presumably that costs two movement points. Uh, ending in front of the door. She, she assigns the remaining two movement to the command module. Right, okay, so when you move, you can split your movement between you and the command module. So each AP spent allows you to move one space or the command module one space. So we've got four movement points. Two was to move byte from there to there and two was to move bit from there to there. Right. And the unused, uh, sorry, the used action dice are now gone. So these two dice that we used for the movement, they are gone. They go back in the tray. Okay. We now move to here and we are now on action two and the burn cycle tracker has reached the captain's chip. So we need to resolve this. Move each security unit one space in the direction they currently face. Okay. So that one moves to there, presumably with its key, and that one moves to there. Right, okay, next. Um, this means that bite must, yeah, which forces you to move each security unit one space in the direction they currently face. The hamster moves one space to the right, taking its key with it, and the walker moves one space down. Room guards would also move from this effect, but the bulldog is facing the wall. So it, it, it doesn't move because it would move that way. Right, got it. So whenever that captain's effect happens, you move every security unit on the board. Byte can now proceed with her action. So after you've done that, you still get to do an action when it's the captain's chip. Um, and Byte is going to take the keypad action. So the keypad action is another type of action. All of the actions, by the way, are summarised uh, here. These are all of the different types of actions that you can do. And you can see that we're going to be doing a keypad action, which is the utility action. Which is described here. Um, so this is basically trying to get through the doors, because all doors are locked at the start of the game. You can't just move through them. OK, so what happens is uh, she takes a keypad action on the door she's adjacent to and draws the following card. OK, so whenever you do a keypad action, you basically draw uh, the next keypad card and let's zoom in on this but for this tutorial it is telling us which one we need to use so I'm just going to get it it's not that one is it that one that's the one right so that is the keypad card that we've drawn yeah no facing on the box thank you Dan uh, keypad cards go there right so this is the keypad card. We are on floor one. So we are looking at the leftmost column. Um, and Byte must resolve the, fir yeah, the first column. She cannot choose to use brute force because it is jammed. So if it says jam below it, you cannot use brute force because there's two ways to get through a door. You can either use brute force to bash through or you can try and hack into it. And because it says jam, it means we can't use brute force. So she decides to resolve its input, which is a physical input. Yeah, physical input at the top. There are two ways a physical input can be resolved, aside from bypassing with an optimised action. The first is to move the burn cycle tracker to a physical action chip in the burn cycle that's in any burn cycle slot to the right of the current position. OK, so what it's saying is, if there was a physical action chip somewhere in here, we could basically skip ahead to that chip if it was a physical chip. So if that was there, we could skip ahead to here and that counts and that gets us in. But we don't have that, but we do have a physical chip here. And this is the other way of getting in. The other option which Byte takes is to discard a physical reserve chip. So she discards this, that's gone, that goes back in the tray. Um, having successfully unlocked the door, she discards the keypad card. Got rid of that. Um, and places a door peg into here. So that means 
that door is now unlocked. And when you unlock a door, you get a free move into the lobby. So Byte is now moving into the lobby. Because the room hasn't been surveilled, because it has this bead on it, uh, you remove the surveillance bead, and then we roll one of the white surveillance dice. Okay, so this is the white surveillance dice. Um, and we've rolled, and it's landed on... It's landed on a guard! Oh no! Because this is floor one, it's a level one guard. So we draw a random level one guard from the tray, and it is hamster. Not random, tutorial. Telling me it's hamster. And we place it in the room's security post here, facing the wall. Okay, so because we rolled that when we went in the room, we drew a level one guard, and it goes on there. And it could be anything. It could be all sorts of things. So you might not have a guard in there. But that's what we got. With a new guard in play, Byte must immediately check its awareness. Now, awareness we haven't covered yet. Um, so let's let's go back to the section on awareness. Oh, brute forces are, are trying every possible combination. It's not bashing it in. Oh, thank you very much, Michael. Yeah, you're probably right on that. Um, so there's a section on awareness that we did skip over, but it is very important. It's a massive part of the game. So awareness. Let's just read awareness. Um, awareness is an overarching concept that must be monitored throughout the players' and the corporation's turn. It's basically think it's permanently in effect for the whole game. Security units have an awareness range shown on their chips. So it's the number on the right hand side. So it's six for hamster, two for walker. They're not very aware. Um, and it's based on its facing. Security units are aware of the spaces in their area that are directly in front of them up to their awareness range. Additionally, security units have a peripheral awareness, which is half of their awareness range. This is how many spaces away the security unit is aware for any space in its area, not directly in front of it. So basically, um, yeah, Walker has a two awareness, but only for the spaces directly in front of it. Everywhere else, it's half that, it's one. So a walker can see here, but not here. Hamster has got a six range, so can see six straight ahead, but three in any other direction. So one, two, three, uh, you know, and behind it as well. When a bot is on a space that a security unit is aware of, at any time during the game, it is considered to be within the security unit's awareness. This immediately causes the bot to be detected, which means they place their awareness chip on their space with their bot chip. As long as they remain within the awareness of any security unit, they will remain detected. If they move outside of a security unit's awareness, they leave their awareness chip on the last space where they were detected. Doors. This is the part of the rules that we spent weeks on and then it changed. So, the only time a security unit's awareness extends beyond its own area is when a detected bot moves through a door. When this happens, Security units are temporarily aware of the space on the other side of the door, if their awareness reaches that space. This awareness ends as soon as the bot has finished moving through the door. Whether a security unit sees a bot go through a door determines whether their awareness chip goes with them. OK, I'm hoping that will be explained with some examples later on. We've got safe zones and we've got hiding spots. We'll come back to that later on. But basically, now that Byte has entered this room, we need to see... Oh, hello, Loki. Are you going to come and help me work out these awareness rules? Oh, you've got a wet nose. Um, anybody who doesn't know I have a cat just thinks I'm randomly talking to Norse gods. Yeah, you're a Norse god, aren't you? No, It's being cute. Um, where was it? Where was it? You coming up? Come on. Yeah. Right, here we go. With a new guard in play... Oh, hang on. Yeah, come on. You want food, don't you? Because Daddy didn't give you the food that you wanted. Come on. Yeah, there you go. Say hello to your adoring audience. Don't even think about crawling across the board. Don't even think about it. Right, are we reading this? You going to read it? No. With a new guard in play, Byte must immediately check its awareness. The ha... The hamster, you like hamsters, don't you? The hamster has an awareness range of six, 
and therefore a peripheral awareness of three, which means byte is within its awareness. Yeah, so three away, byte is within its awareness. However, byte has silent entry. Okay, so byte has a special ability called silent entry. When byte enters a room, she may treat the first space she moves to as a hiding spot until she moves off of it. Okay, so if it if it weren't for the silent entry, byte would have now have been detected and the awareness chip would have been placed on there. But because of silent entry, this space is considered to be a hiding spot. Right, got it. Okay. So the hamster doesn't detect her. Awesome. Right, action three. So it's a generic one, so we can do any action again. Byte takes another move action. So she's going to roll the remainder of her dice. Byte has three dice left. So she rolls these and gets a yellow three, which is awesome, a blue two, and a blue one. These dice are lovely. Um, Byte can't use tumble magnet to change either of the basic dice to a three, because you don't get threes on a blue dice, but she can change the one to a two. So that gives her seven movement points. Wow, what's she going to do with seven movement points? So, she's going to move two spaces to the right. Now, the first space there is now outside of the hamster's awareness. Because remember, it's, it's got a three peripheral awareness, which is not enough. So, one to there, another one to there, and another one to there. So, again, still maintaining outside of the awareness. Um, this would be awesome as a computer game or some kind of... Um, Augmented reality, so that you could actually see glowing areas. Um, yeah, so two spaces to the right, one space up. Oh no, two spaces up. Ah, now, that would be within the awareness range, but this is a hiding spot. So, yeah, the terminal space falls under the hamster's awareness, but is also a hiding spot. And since Byte entered the hiding spot whilst undetected she remains undetected so this is interesting if you were detected i mean if you think about it thematically it makes sense if you move from a detected space into a hiding space the security unit literally sees you going in there but because she was undetected when she moved in there she remains undetected right okay so that's four movement points used she has three movement points left which she's going to assign to the command module. So a bit goes one space to the left and then one space into the lobby because the door is now open. However, bit is now detected by the hamster. So what happens is we place bit's awareness chip on there. Bit has now been detected. Okay, using the last remaining AP, bit will move one more space to the right. Uh, since this space is outside of the hamster's awareness, the awareness chip stays there. Right, so this is the clever part of the game. Well, one of the clever parts of the game is this is the space, this awareness chip represents the last space where the security guards knew that Bit was. They don't know that Bit has gone here because this is outside of their awareness range. There we go. And that is it. There are now no more chips in the burn cycle. So that is the end of the action step. But you can see, if you had an extra chip in here, you'd get to do four actions each turn, which is quite powerful. Okay, we've not really had the side view on much. Let me turn the side view on just for a minute. There we go. Right, where's my glass of water? Oh, I need to have a drink. How are we doing for time anyway? It is 2.30. I think we're accomplishing quite a lot. I'm hoping this is giving you a good idea of how the game plays because as i say there are other videos out there about the game people have done reviews and stuff like that but i wanted today to give you a this is what the game is going to be like when you first get it when you first get the game and you first set it up this is the experience that you're going to have um it's basically the experience i'm having right now and i, I just wanted to to share it with you okay step four is the network uh, infiltrating the corporation in the physical world is not enough if you're going to be successful here, you've got to infiltrate them in the digital space as well. 
The network step uses the burn cycle in a similar way as the action step in that it uses the burn cycle from left to right. Uh, do I have a preset for the network? I do. Is it going to focus? It is. Um, so each chip in the burn cycle grants movement on the network with the burn cycle chip dictating which node you can move to. Right, okay. So I remember during development of the game, the network was... Um, it, the, the rules about the network changed a lot. This is the final version of the game, so a lot of previous videos will now be wrong, but this is how it works now. So what you have is you have the... Burn, we, basically, we're going to go through this burn cycle again, and what we do is we place the burn cycle tracker here, we then move the agent's IP, or we pass, we resolve the node that it landed on, and then we move to the next one, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so, that's there. Off we go to the network. Right, there's lots of rules about moving your IP, resolving your node, and everything else. I'm just going to re I'm just I'm just going to skip to the tutorial, and we'll come back. So, since the burn cycle only contains the captain and the general action chips, and Byte doesn't have any network cards, so that's another type of card, the network step of Byte's first turn is going to be pretty simple. We place the burn cycle tracker under the first general action chip, done, and then we transfer Byte's IP, which is this one here, from its access point to the tech node it's connected to. Okay, now let's see why that's the case. Moving your IP. IPs move along the network nodes following the lines of the network. The green, lanes, the green lines are layers, and the lines intermittently connecting the layers are called transfers. Okay. IPs move clockwise on the layers. Yep. IPs can use transfers during their movement to move inwards or outwards, but can only use one transfer per burn cycle chip. If you are on a general action chip or the captain action chip, your IP moves exactly one node, clockwise or inwards or outwards on a node with a transfer space. And that's where we were. We were on a general action chip, so we, we've moved one node from there to there. Okay. If you are on a physical tech or utility, then you basically move as far as you can until you hit the next one. Um, and then when you land on a ping, something happens. If you land on a hub, something happens. These are hubs, so something happens when you land on those. Okay, so that's the first one done. Um, then we move the burn cycle tracker to the captain action chip. Um, and we move another one, I believe. Is that right? Place the burn cycle tracker under the first one, do that. Move the burn cycle tracker. Byte will use the second chip to move one node clockwise. Again, landing on a tech node. Right, and now we do the third action, and we've got a choice. We can either move here, or we can transfer and go in. And in the tutorial, it is saying she decides to stay on layer one, since doing so lands on a hub. Okay, so we're going to land on this hub. So these red octagons, these are hubs, and whenever you land on a hub, you gain the benefit of the hub that you are on. In layer one, you increase your network level by one. In layer 2, you reduce the threat, and in layer 3, you gain a power. And in layer 4, which is the core, uh, you get all of the above benefits, and your IP is then booted back to its access point. So, because she's reached a hub on layer 1, the benefit of that is to increase the network level. So the network level goes to 2. Right, there we go. Next. Thank you very much, Paul, for the, uh, the Pling Patreon. It's working now. It wasn't working last night, so I'm glad it's working now. Right, step five, root power. Uh, while these bots can be overcharged for a bit, they aren't able to store their excess power for long. Be sure to use whatever spare power you can before it gets lost, and maybe even spend some more if needed. Go ahead, treat yourself to that fancy ability you've been eyeing all game. So rooting power at the end of your turn works the same as it does at the beginning of your turn. The only difference is that at the end of this step, you lose excess power, the, uh, you lose power in excess of your power bank limit. So. Byte once again has the opportunity to root power, but isn't going to do so. So she decides to save it because she doesn't need to spend it. So now we degrade the burn cycle. Step six of your turn is 
you roll the burn cycle die, which is this yellow one here. I'm not sure why it's yellow, but it is. Um, you roll this, and the number indicates which slot in the burn cycle degrades. Um, if you roll a question mark, you can choose. Now, Byte ends a turn, rolls the burn cycle die, and it lands on a 4. So what that means is there is no active chip in 4, so what you do is you cycle round and it degrades the next available chip. So we cycle round and it goes here, so that is now degraded. And that is it, that is the end of Byte's first turn of the game. So now we go to Access's first turn. So access needs to take a turn. First of all, routing power. Um, not going to root power. Yeah, byte doesn't. Uh, access does not root power at the start of her turn. So now we do the dice pool. Now the dice pool for access is huge. It's seven basic die, dice, and one advanced dice. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, and one. Right, okay, so we go to the burn cycle. Now, the problem is now we have this degraded chip. So what can you do when a chip is degraded? You can do free actions. Uh, free actions can be taken any time on your turn except in the middle of another action or during a resolution. Um, so you could take free actions during the network step of your turn and even after degrading the burn cycle. Okay, so what are free actions then? Let's have a look. Free action. Altering the burn cycle. Okay, so altering the burn cycle is a free action, and as it says, you can do that at any time on your turn, even after you've degraded the burn cycle at the end of your turn. So, access is going to alter the burn cycle. Now, when you alter the burn cycle, uh, what she's going to do, she's going to remove the general chip in slot 1 and replace it with a physical chip from the team's reserve. There you go. So that is altering the burn cycle. If Access had not done this, she would basically skip the first action. But by doing this, she can do an action. And as far as I understand from what I read earlier on, if she does a physical action, it's optimised. So she can, do, she can still do any action, but if you do a physical action, it is optimised. So this is what she's going to do. Using the new physical chip in the burn cycle, she takes a move action. Because she wants to move at least one space, she rolls two basic action die. But she's going to get two additional action points anyway. Oh, I see. Oh, I know what's coming. So she's basically going to choose two action dice, uh, rolls these, and gets uh, and gets a one and a blank. Two blanks make a one. She doesn't have two blanks, so that blank isn't spent. The blank actually goes back here. So she's got one action point. Okay, so that one action point um, is going to be used to move from here to here. Now, taking a move action is a physical action, and because she's on a physical chip, that would be optimised, and that normally gets an additional two action points. But if we remember, Access has this which basically says the next time your agent takes an optimised physical action, which is what she's about to do, you do not get the optimised benefit. So I think she has accomplished this imperative. Yeah, so she forgoes the benefit, completes the card. What she could have done is she could have taken the two action points, but then she would have disregarded this order, lost one power, and discarded the card. But as it is, that card is discarded. We can put that at the back, and she actually gains one power. That's pretty cool. Right. That's it. That's action one done. Moved one, move next to the door. Action two, so we move to the burn cycle slot, is the captain. Okay, so again, the captain says all security units move one space. So we've got that hamster moving to there. Uh, I'll look at what happens when they reach a wall in a minute. That one moves to there. That one's facing a wall so it doesn't move. That one's facing the wall so it doesn't move. Access now takes her second action and she's going to choose the keypad action. Surprise, surprise. So we're going to draw another keypad and let's see what the tutorial tells us we get. Okay, we've got uh, 
I'm just finding the one that it said. Oh, there's plenty of these. Don't think you're going to remember all of these, are you? That one? That one. Okay, so that's the one we've just drawn. Get it then. Right, okay. So, again, we're on floor one. So we're looking at the leftmost column and we have this icon. Now, what that icon means is we roll the keypad die to determine what that icon actually is. Now, which is the keypad die? I think it's this fancy red one. Yeah, this would make sense. Um, so we roll this die and we rolled, uh, which is tech. Tech is green, isn't it? Yeah, so we've rolled that. Okay, so basically that icon there is that one. So she chooses to discard the tech chip. Yeah, is that right? Yeah, so she's going to discard the tech chip um, from her reserve to unlock the door. Right, okay, so we discard the tech chip. That goes back in there. Uh, we are going to unlock the door. So we put a little peg in here to say that that's unlocked. And whenever you unlock a door, come on, get in there. The hole's not quite big enough. There it is. Free movement in. This puts her within the awareness of the hamster, causing her to be detected. Yes, so the hamster's detection range is three, peripheral vision, one, two, three. So access has been detected. Okay. Right, next, action has, uh, sorry, access has one advanced action dice and six, that one's gone, six basic action dice, and we've only got one action left. So I think she's going to roll, she, she's going to move. Yeah, so action three is going to move. Uh, and she basically, she gets a two, three ones, and three blanks. Now remember, two blanks can make a one. Um, so basically she's got one, two, three, four, five, six AP. So six action points. So what she's going to do is, again, following the tutorial, she's going to move two to the right. One, two. Keeping her awareness chip because she's still detected by the hamster. Now she's adjacent to the hamster. Its ability grapple one will trigger. Aha, right. Okay, so at this point, the security unit has an ability called grapple one. Now that will be explained in the rules reference, but I'm just going to follow through the tutorial. Basically says that uh, the Grapple 1 ability triggers. This requires one additional AP to be used in order to move away from this guard. So she's got four AP left and she has to spend two of them to move one more space to the right. There you go. Let me just put the um, let me just put the sideways view on. Just, just uh, something a bit different. And again, Thank you very much to all of my Patreon supporters for funding the channel, because your funding allows me to buy new fancy kit like this. Um, yeah, which which really, really does look good. So yeah, so access has moved through the door into here, then to here, then to here. The grapple one then kicks in, so she has to spend two movement points to move to there. And then finally, she's got two movement points left. She moves one, two. Now, the final space is outside of the hamster's awareness. Remember, three peripheral awareness, that's one, two, three, which means the awareness chip, I believe, stays on there. Yeah. Okay. Done. Right, so that's what Access did. Came in here, ran around, the hamster spotted her, grappled her, uh, and then lost sight of her here. So as far as the security units are concerned, this is the last place that access was seen. Right, we're now going to go to the network phase. This time we have a physical chip here. Okay, so what that means is uh, that she can transfer her IP into layer one and then moves her IP towards the physical node on that layer. Right, okay, so let's have a look at the network. 
because it's a physical chip that we're, we're evaluating, it means she could transfer in and move all the way around to here and stop on there. That's what she could do. However, there is a hub here that she wants to stop at. So she stops on the hub instead. The benefit of the layer one hub allows her to increase her network level by one. Okay, so she's done that. So she could have gone all the way to here, but she chooses to stop here, right? Then we go to the captain's action chip, uh, which basically allows her to move one step. So she's going to transfer to there. And then the third action is a generic action chip. She moves clockwise, one node lands on the utility node. So I don't, oh yeah, yeah, it's just for movement. Right, okay, we're done. Next, routing power. Access knows that Byte is about to complete a level, uh, the floor one objective, is she? Okay, cool. Uh, and that's gonna give three power to all agents. Since bots cannot have more than 10 power, and Access has eight power in her bank, although that's at her limit, she wants to spend it to bring her power down to seven, because she knows that Byte is about to complete the objective. So, oh, these dice should have gone. Oh, and all of this should have gone. Tidy up, Paul. Okay, so what she's going to do is spend one power, or root one power, to buy the... Which special ability is she buying? Repair. So she's got the repair ability. Okay. And then step six is we degrade the burn cycle. So we roll the die... Roll the burn cycle die. Yeah, it's a shame that this is yellow because it's a little bit too similar to that. I mean, it does have a white number. I'm just being fussy. Um, so we've rolled and we've got a three. There you go, got a three. So that means this one degrades. Access's turn is now over. Okay, so because Access's turn is now over, it is now the corporation's turn. So again, once all players have had a turn, you then do the corporation's turn. Right, okay. How are people finding it? If you are watching this video and you didn't know how to play Burn Cycle, I am interested in hearing from you right now what you, th what you think. Um, do you feel that this video is helping you explain how it works? If you already know how to play Burn Cycle, then obviously, yeah, you already know. But if, if you didn't know anything about Burn Cycle at the start of this video, I'm just curious to see how you're finding it. Because as I said earlier on, for me, this is by far the best way to learn it. It's a massive rule book. Uh, and there's a rules reference as well. We haven't even touched on the rules reference. So yeah, right. Corporation's turn. Again, we have lots of information uh, about what happens on the corporation's turn. I might... I might just skim read this and come back to it if we need it, okay? But the corporation's turn consists of three steps. We activate all of the security units, then there is ping activation, presumably from the network, and then there is threat advancement. So security unit activation, and this was probably the hardest bit of the rule book to write. Um, I remember we went round this bit over and over and over again. Uh, and it changed a lot since I worked on it as well. But let, let's crack on and see if we can understand it. So each security unit on the board is going to activate once. When it activates depends on its priority level. So priority one is pursue, priority two is investigate, and priority three is patrol. Um, okay, so the first thing we're going to do is pursue. Security units will pursue detected bots that are currently within their awareness. So we're looking for a detected bot, which is within their, with, with, sorry, a bot which has its awareness chip on it, which is currently within awareness range. Now, I don't think that's any. So let's have a look. Let's walk through the corporation's turn. Pursue. Yes, none of the bots are currently within the awareness of any security units. So basically, if there is a bot on the board and their awareness chip is literally is on the bot, 
which means it's a detected bot and it's currently within the awareness range of a security unit, that security unit will try to pursue it. Okay. Step two, or priority two, is investigate. Security units will investigate all remaining awareness chips in play, which represent disturbances that they need to check out. Okay, well, we have one there and we have one there. So we have two awareness chips in play. As a team, choose a bot's awareness chip that is in play and hasn't been flipped. Yeah, because you flip them over if they've been pursued. Um, which includes awareness chips on detected bots that were not pursued because they were... Yeah, okay, right. Investigate. Since both Access and Bit have their awareness chips in play and they weren't pursued, their awareness chips will be investigated. The team decides which chip is investigated first. So what we're going to do is we're going to resolve Access's chip first. The team determines that the hallway hamster is closest and will therefore be the unit that investigates. Okay, so you find the closest security unit, which, which is this one, and you move it towards the awareness chip and onto it if possible. And basically each security unit has a movement value printed on the left hand side, so it's two. So the hamster only has two movement points. Um, yeah, okay. So um, it's got a movement stat of two, so the hamster moves one space to the right. So I guess it follows its direction, turns to the right, and then moves one space forward. Is that right? At this point, yeah. Oh, no, no, hang on. So we, we've reached the wall, we turn to the right, and then, this is, this is interesting, at this point, access is now within the awareness because straight line is six. So access is now suddenly within awareness. So what happens is the awareness ship is now put back on there. Okay, the hamster then finishes its movement, continuing towards access's awareness ship by moving down one space. Flip both the hamster and the awareness chip to indicate that they've been resolved. So we flip that over temporarily, just so we know we've done it. And we flip that over so that we know we've done that. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Hamster could have been moved down first and then right, but the end result would have been the same. Okay, so bits awareness chip. The closest one to this is this. Um, the hamster uses its movement stat of two to move two spaces down, so they can walk backwards. Okay, one, two, and then it rotates that way. Now, I'm not sure of the rules, where the rules are listed that it says to do that. Bit was detected after the hamster's first move. Hang on, right. So first move is there, that is now there, so that goes there. Okay. And again, the team had an alternate option to move the hamster right and then down. Okay, so instead of doing that, it could have gone there and then there. But they choose that it goes there. That puts that on there. And then it goes there and turns that way. Is that right? Now that all security units can activate, have done so. So then what you do is you flip them over. All security units that can activate have done so. So you turn all flipped units and awareness chips back over. This is the most complicated part of the game from what I remember. And I just need to read the rule. I mean, we've done it right because it's a tutorial, but I need to read the rules on security units movement. Security unit movement, okay. Security units can move as many spaces as their movement stat allows. They will always change the direction they face towards the direction they are moving. Okay, so they can move in any direction, but then they immediately turn to face that direction. So basically that will move to there and then to there. And so they always move in the direction they are facing and always face what they are moving towards. Security units will use their full movement unless they reach their target 
or they would move onto a space occupied by a bot, or they have no route to their target space. Security units cannot move through bots or walls, but can move through doors, whether or not they are locked. Security units do not block each other's movement. So if a security unit was to move onto a space occupied by another security unit, they swap spaces. Um, if a security unit does not reach their target space, or if they patrolled, we, we haven't seen the patrolling yet, they will finish their movement facing the direction they would next be moving if they had more movement. Right, that's the bit. So if this was to move any more, its next movement would be that way. Therefore, it ends facing in that direction. Okay. If their target is a bot and they finish their movement adjacent to it, they will face the bot. If their target is an awareness chip and they end their movement on its space, clearing it, the security unit will maintain the facing of their last move. Right, okay, I think we've got it. Oof, gosh. I haven't got to the patrols yet. Yes, we're not quite at the patrols yet. The chips shouldn't be flipped until after patrol. Um, did I do something wrong? I was just, I was just following what it said. Oh no, no, you're right. I skipped ahead. Thank you. I'm right. I'm, you're right. I missed that bit. I got distracted by the pretty picture. There was a pretty picture here and I thought, yeah, that's fine. Okay. So let's, let's go back to this bit. This is the bit that I was a little puzzled about, which is here. And let's, uh, let's go for the side camera again. And we're going, we're going here, aren't we? It's quite thematic, that fact that I've got a security camera <laughs> looking at what we're doing. Right, okay, where's me? Where's me bottle of water? Okay, so let's work this out. We are in priority two, which is investigate. And this hamster is going to investigate this. And it's got two movements and we as a team we can choose where this moves i believe so it can move as many spaces as its movement allows it will always change direction to face the direction it's moving it will use its full movement determining a route for security units moving towards a bot, no, it's not a bot. For security mo units moving towards anything else, their target is the space that the chip is on. So it's trying to move towards this space. It will always take the shortest route to get to where they're going, which is the fewest number of spaces. Cannot go through walls, but it can go through other units as well as chips, dice, beads, etc., etc. There are multiple options the team decides. So it, it could move one, two. It could move one, two or it could move one, two. I think we have three choices of where this moves. These two choices end it there. This choice ends it there. Okay. Now it does say the team had an alternative option to move the hamster right and then down. We could have done that, but the team opted for this route because it keeps the guard further away from, from, oh, I think there's a typo in the rule book. I think that should be bit. <laughs> oh, no, 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 bite. It, is, it isn't a typo. It keeps the guard further away from bite. I forgot about bite. Bite was hiding in the corner. Right, so that's why the team has chosen to send it here because it's further away from bite. Whereas if we'd have gone there and there, that's closer. Right, okay. So this is interesting. Although you're moving the guard, you have some choice over where the guards move. Now, let's just go through this. If we had have gone there first, then that would have now been within the awareness range. So that would have gone on there. And then at this point, you still go there. You don't go there. You definitely don't want to go there. But could you go there? It's interesting because the the, 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 complicate, the complication comes in when the awareness chip moves during the movement. But let, let's just go with it. That's how it is. That's there. That's there. We're all good. 
Okay. I think we're done. That's, that's investigate. Now we go to patrol. So secures units that can patrol now do so. Guards that are in rooms don't patrol unless otherwise stated. So the bulldog in here doesn't patrol um, but the walker will patrol and it will patrol around the perimeter of the hallway with its movement stat of four. So it's going to move down three spaces because that's the direction it's facing. Um, then it turns and then it moves one space to the left. Now the reason it's doing that is because it is on patrol. You move any security unit that has not yet been activated, including guards, sorry, not including guards in rooms. And you move the security unit according to its patrol. This is indicated by the icon on their chip. So the icon on the chip here tells you uh, how it moves. And this is all explained in the quick reference on page 43. Oh, which is the back of this book, I believe. Yeah, quick reference, page 43, security patrols, it's, it's perimeter. So it follows the outer perimeter of its area, moving counterclockwise. If it is not facing a direction that would have it move counterclockwise following the perimeter, it will turn right. If it is not on a space that is part of the outer perimeter, it will take the shortest route back to an outer perimeter space. If it is not on a space that is part of the outer perimeter, it will take the shortest route back to an outer perimeter space and then continue moving counterclockwise. It's quite complicated. <laughs> but that's what the tutorial has told us it's doing. So that's what we're going to do. Right, there are no other guards, I believe, to patrol. So now we're done. And now we flip over. Yeah, so all of the stuff that was now flipped, we now flip back. You've got to make sure you maintain the, uh, the correct orientation. Right, there you go. Security guard unit movement. Next, step two of the corporation's turn is we activate pings. In this step, each ping on the network is activated. If there are, if there are pings on the network, they activate starting with the pings on the most outward layers and working inwards. If there are multiple pings on the same layer, the first ping that will activate is the one with the most space behind. I remember writing these rules as well. This was, <laughs> this was quite tricky to write. We currently have no pings on the network. So what happens instead is the CEO adds a ping to the core, but it does not move. And the core is there. Okay, and next time that ping is going to move around. And basically pings are going to come out from the center of the network. They're going to go around here and they're going to try and attack these IPs. Um, Yeah, so if there are pings on the network, they activate. If there are no pings on the network, the CEO instead adds a ping to the core. Um, then roll the ping die a number of times equal to the number of hubs occupied by pings at this time. So we roll one die. Yeah, because this, this, this is the core, but it's also a hub. Okay, so we're going to roll the network die, which is this one. And we've rolled, what have we rolled? We've rolled uh, that. Okay, and that icon means that we increase the CEO's network level by one. So we're going to increase that from one to two. Yeah, all the different die results do different things. And you roll for each ping that is on a hub. Note the number of times the ping die is rolled before any rolls are made. Yes. Okay, right, done, next. Oh, then you get banned from the network. So it says it is in your team's, oh, hello, Loki, it's come back, settling down. Um, it's in your team's best interest to boot pings before they get out to layer one. So if these pings get out to layer one, that's bad because they can get you booted or something like that. Okay. Step three is we advance threat. So the threat was this thing here that we showed at the start of the game. And what we now do is we advance threat based on the number of players in the game. 
Uh, threat represents how heightened the security, the corporation's security is against intruders. It advances through various effects in the game, including when the burn cycle is rebooted, uh, through the ping die when striking a security unit, and at the end of each round. If it ever reaches mission failed, then it's game over. Um, and whenever your threat advances, move the threat bead down the indicated number of spaces. Whenever it's reduced, move it back up. And then you've got threat events and you've got threat escalation. So we are advancing the threat two spaces because there's two players in the game. Uh, and that's it. There's no, there's no escalation. There's no activity or anything like that. And that's it. That's the end of the round. Yeah. Right. So round one is over. We are going to play a bit more. What time is it? Three o'clock. I've got another hour and a half. We're totally playing more. Continuing the tutorial. Yeah, okay, right, we're playing a bit more. Next, next thing to explain is rebooting the burn cycle. So immediately before the start of any player's turn, the team may interrupt the round in order to reboot the burn cycle. It is the team's choice when this happens. This is generally done as infrequently as possible when reserves are spent and the team is short on actions. It's like kind of resting. Um, though there, there may be other strategic reasons to reboot your burn cycle as well. Um, resolve the burn cycle reboot in the following order. Okay, well let, let's read that when we need to reboot the burn cycle because I don't know whether we need to just yet. We also have ending the floor. So at the end of a player's turn, if the floor's objectives are completed and all bots are in safe zones, the floor is automatically completed. Okay, so we need two. One bot has to access a terminal. We're going to be doing that very soon. And then after that, all bots have to be in safe zones. All bots or agents? All bots. Yeah. And then we transfer to the next floor. And if you finish the final floor, then you've won. And then rules about shutdown bots are there. Right, continuing the tutorial. Off we go. Round two. So, Bite. Bite has got four power. We're not going to root power at the start of the turn. So we build the dice pool. The dice pool has four basic dice and one advanced dice. Okay. Um, right, there is a physical chip here. So if we were to do a physical action, it would be optimised. But we don't want to do a movement because we want to do a terminal action and a terminal action is a tech action. So we could, if we really wanted to, as a, 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 we could do a free action. We could change the burn cycle, swap out the physical chip for a, a tech chip and then we could do a tech action and it would be optimised. We could. These are all things that you could do. There's a lot of choices in this game. Um, but we're not going to do that. We're going to follow through the tutorial, which says what we're going to do, Paul. With the physical chip in slot one, Byte's first action will be movement. OK, so Byte is going to do an optimised movement first. Um, and be, yeah, movement is a physical action. The chip is a physical chip, which means it's an optimised move. So she gets two free action points. Does she want to spend any dice? No. So she's going to do the movement action, not roll any dice and just use the two movement points to move the command module. So bit is going to move to there. Since bit is within the awareness of the hamster who were awareness chip, yeah, still within the range of the ham, so still within awareness range of the hamster, but now the hamster is slightly out of range of the hamster, okay? Now, she can't move again, oh, she could, why, why wouldn't she move there? OK, we'll find out later. We'll find out why Bit is only moving right one space. Next, action two is the captain's chip. So we have to move all security units one space. Oh. So this hamster moves to there. This hamster moves to there. And this walker moves to there. Oh dear, access is in a bit of trouble. This bulldog doesn't move because it's facing the wall still. 
Nothing changes with the current awareness and detection, though access is again adjacent to the hamster and will need to contend with its grapple one skill. Yes. Right. Now, Byte gets to do an action here, and Byte is going to do the terminal action. Now, we've not seen this yet, um, but how does the terminal action work? Basically, you draw a terminal access card. So there are terminal access cards, which are these, and the card that we've drawn is... I'm going to have to find the one that's described in the... Uh, oh, there's lots of these. Probably at the back. Nope, found it. These cards have still got that chip theory game smell. So this is the card that we've drawn. Um, yeah, so since she's on a terminal, she draws a terminal access card. While all of the card's options would be useful, unlocking a door seems like the best choice, seeing that access could use some help in getting away from the guards surrounding her. So basically, you can choose which option you want. Uh, and we're going to choose the bottom option. Cycle lockdown protocol. Unlock a door of your choice. Um, and then what you do, you roll the dice. And you're trying to get, I believe, three action points. Okay. So it suggests that we roll a yellow and two blue. And that's what we've rolled which means we don't need to use the tumble magnet because we've already got four, which need, which passes the three that we need. So those dice all disappear. Uh, and then we get to unlock a door of our choice. So we're going to unlock this door here. Okay, so that door there is now unlocked, so access can sneak in. Uh, right. With the terminal byte on is now used, its chip is returned to the supply. Okay, so this this terminal here is removed. Now, I'm just looking at this um, imperative card. The next time your agent takes a terminal action, yeah, you must not be on a tech chip in the burn cycle. We was not. So this goes and we get a power, I think. I think the tutorial is going to get to that point in a minute. Let's see what it says. She decides to unlock the equipment room. Yeah. Yeah. Also completes byte remote jammer in op uh, imperative. So she discards the card and gains one power. Excellent. With the terminal access, the team has completed the floor one objective. Remember, our floor one objective was access a terminal. We've done that, which means all agents get three power. So we go from 5 to 8, and we go from 7 to 10. It's like XP. Love XP. Um, yeah, the command module does not gain this reward. Since the floor's objective is complete, it's time for the bots to get to the safe zones. Okay, so the next thing is we're going to move to here. But before that, we're going to do a free action, and we're going to alter the burn cycle by swapping this chip out with this chip. Okay. And then action three, uh, byte is going to make bit do an optimized keypad action. Ah, right. So you can actually get, um, you can get the command module to do keypad actions. Right. I know you can get the command module to move. I didn't realise you could get the command module to do keypad actions. So that's quite cool. So what we're going to do is we're going to do... Um, oh yeah, it says here, your agent stroke CM. Okay, so the reference card that's included in the game actually tells you when you move, it's your agent and the command module. When you strike security or a wall, it's your agent or the command module. With the keypad, it's your agent or the command module. Terminal, your agent or command module and repair your agent or command module. So basically, yeah, and trading is as well. So you can always do an action yourself, pretty much all, with the command module. Okay, right, so Byte is going to use uh, her third action to tell the command module to do a keypad action, and because it's a utility chip, 
it is an optimized action. Right. Okay. So what happens is we draw the keypad card for the command module. And again, the tutorial is telling us which one it is. It's not that one. It's that one. That's the one we've drawn. Ah, so we can brute force it at a cost of four action points. If we really wanted to, we could brute force it. Um, and I remember there being a discussion with Shannon about these cards. Was it me that suggested Jam should be down at the bottom instead of at the top? I, I think I did. I think that was one of my suggestions. Um, so, since the action is optimised, you can ignore the tech input and freely unlock the door. Ah, right, let me just have a look at this again. Let me just go back in the rule book. Um, actions. Here we go. Keypad action. If it is optimised... Where is it? It's here somewhere. Yeah. In any order, resolve all input requirements for the keypad. If optimised, ignore any one input on the keypad. So because it was optimised, we can literally ignore that one icon there, which means the door is the door is unlocked. Yeah. Okay. So that that disappears. That goes to the back. The door is unlocked. And then Bit gets a free movement onto the other side of the door. Still in awareness range of the hamster, I believe. Yeah, her awareness chip comes with her because the ham the hamster's hamper, the hamster's awareness temporarily goes through the door. So whilst the hamster does not normally have awareness to this space, because Bit moved from a from a door space to there, the hamster basically saw her going through the door. So the awareness chip goes with her. Right, got it. Now we go to the network. Okay, so it is Byte's turn and we're doing the network. The first chip in the network is physical. Let me just put these here temporarily. These, these are the action chips in the burn cycle. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just put them here. So we're first on a physical chip and Byte can now move clockwise to the next physical chip. Um, which is basically here. So you can move as far as she wants clockwise to the next physical one. So it's there. Okay. But you can't go down as part of that. Now we do the captain's chip and she moves one to there. Uh, and then we do this utility chip and can go clockwise as far as she wants until she gets to one of those. Um, Using the utility ship, she will move one node clockwise and then transfer in again. Okay, so why couldn't she... Oh yeah, yeah, so purple moves to there, captain moves one, and then utility... So you can go down, I'm just going to check this in the rules. I mean, I know it's right, I just want to read the rules on network. Moving your IP. IPs can use transfers during their movement to move inwards, but can only use one transfer per burn cycle chip. So yeah, so she, she, she's moving to the next available blue space clockwise, and as part of that, can make one transfer. So she could go here, here, and all the way to here, if she wanted to. But she isn't. She's stopping here to get one power, because it's level three. So that's one power on Byte. Byte is up to nine power. Yeah. Yeah, if I've understood that correctly, she could have kept going. Yeah, so you have to stop on a node occupied... Oh, you have to stop on hubs. Ah, right, so she can't have kept going. So you have to stop. If you, if you reach a ping, you have to stop. If you reach a hub, you have to stop. Or if you reach a node matching the action type of the chip in the burn cycle. Right, okay, got it. Let's pop those back. There we 
we go. That's probably what the chat's saying. Yeah, stopping at hubs is mandatory. Thank you. Right, next. Routing power. So Byte now has nine power, which is insane. Um, so she's going to have to activate some upgrades because otherwise she's going to lose all of it. So we're going to spend two power to activate a second advanced die. Um, because she's now at the limit of her advanced dice, she's going to spend another two power to convert one of those into an elite dice. Elite die, right, okay. Finally, she activates her push ability for one power. So she's got that as well. Giving her options in case she finds herself trapped by any guards in the safe zone. Right, now we're going to degrade the burn cycle. So we roll the burn cycle die and we get a one, which means that is now degraded. Okay, right, round two, it is access. Does access want to spend any power before her turn? And the answer is yes, she's gonna spend two power to activate her spoof ability. Now remember, each each of these bots have has multiple abilities. We've not really looked at these at all. There's so much detail in this game. Um, so this basically gives her more movement options on the network. She's got eight power remaining. So dice pool. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And an advanced one. Okay, so that's the dice pool. Right. Before taking her first action, Access alters the burn cycle, discarding that chip and replacing it with the tech chip from the team's reserve. Now she's going to make the use of the tech chip to make an optimized network card action. Is that an action we've seen before? It isn't. We've seen terminal cards, we haven't seen network cards before. So this is a new action we've not seen yet. And there is a new type of card in the game, which are these network cards. Let me just have a look over at Access. So network cards. And you can do a network action wherever you are. But it's only you that can do it. Okay. So we're going to draw a network card. And we have drawn cookies. Nom, nom, nom. Getting hungry, actually. That's what happens when you skip lunch. Yeah, the problem with me doing this playthrough starting at one o'clock is that I've skipped my lunch break. Um, but I had to start it at one, because if I'd have started at two, I wouldn't have got this done before the unboxing video. That's why I started early. Um, so, basically, she draws the following network card. So, cookies. Skip the ping activation step of the corporation's turn this round. Okay, that's quite cool. I don't know what the stuff is at the top. Let me read the section on network cards. Network cards. I don't remember this bit from working on the rules. This might be new, or I might have just forgotten. Network cards. The network is full of useful nodes, but their benefits are hidden behind code. Cracking the code will give you information. Um, your agent can take this action from anywhere. Draw one network card. If you now have more than three, discard down to three. If optimized, in addition to drawing a network card, take any unoptimized action of your choice. This may include drawing another network card. Okay, so it's not something that happens straight away. It's Is it a card that I can keep? Hmm. Or is it permanent? And I don't know what the thing means here. Right, where are network cards explained? Ah, what is a network card? Network cards can be drawn as an action. They outline a network node type and layer. Ah, okay, so it's that type of node on layer two. During the network stage of your turn, if you land on a node that matches the type and layer, you may gain the benefit on the card. Network cards are discarded at the end of your turn so you may have to prioritise hitting the right nodes, sometimes at the cost of not hitting a hub or booting a ping. However, the benefits of the cards can be well worth it. Right, okay, so that network card stays here, and it's going to disappear at the end of the turn, even if you don't use it. 
Gosh. Page 29. That seems harsh, if you don't use it. Landing on an action node. Gain the benefit of the network card, and then discard the resolve network card. Does it, does it definitely? Yeah, you get to keep it till the end of the turn. Wow. I thought you'd have been able to keep those from one turn to the next. I mean, you've spent an action to get the card, and if you don't use it, you lose it. I mean, it does say. It's just the fact that it says if you now have more than three network cards, discard down to three. So you could spend your entire turn collecting network cards. If you ever find yourself on a tech action chip in the burn cycle and don't plan to use it for a terminal action, draw yourself a network card. You'll get to take another action as well, so it's basically a free network card. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Right. Okay, anyway, back to the tutorial. What's it now telling me to do? Um, optimizing a network card action allows you to take an unoptimized action as well, so she's going to use movement, and she's going to roll all dice. So rolls all of her dice and gets two, two, four ones, and three blanks. She converts one of the rolled blanks back to a dice pool, converts the other two into a one, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine movement points. Okay, nine movement points. She's adjacent to the hamster. So it's going to cost her an extra one movement point to move away. So that's two to move to there. The awareness chip stays there. Uh, but then she moves here because the door's unlocked. Since the peripheral awareness of the hamster is high enough to see her move through the door, her awareness chip will follow her inside. Yeah, so the hamster, this room is not inside the hamster's area, but because the door was temporarily open and it can see three, then the access chip goes with it. The, the hamster basically knows that she's gone through the door. Right, access then moves up one space, but the awareness chip, I believe, stays there. Um, collecting the cash and drawing a battery pack from the equipment deck, which she adds to her inventory, along with the corresponding equipment die. So we, we've equipment. We've not seen equipment yet at all in the game. Um, but there are there is basically a free action. I believe it's a free action to pick up an equipment cash. Actions, yes. So free actions. Um, oh no, it's not. Or is it? It says altering the burn cycle or trading. Collecting caches. Right, where's the rules on collecting caches? Oh, it's probably, it's during movement, isn't it? Yeah. So during movement, whenever you move onto a space containing a cache, you can optionally collect it. Draw an equipment card and return the cache chip to the supply. So as soon as during movement, you enter a cache chip, you take it, you put it back in the supply and you get a random equipment card. But for this tutorial, we are getting the, which one we're getting? Battery pack. So many cards. Battery pack. Once per turn, when rolling for an AP check, your agent may include this die in the roll to gain hash additional AP. Ah, so it comes with the dice and it's dice number one. So one of the things we've not seen in the game yet is all these equipment dice. So these are all unique, and basically each piece of equipment that comes with the die comes with its, and this is this is die number one, so this goes on there. This is very similar to Too Many Bones in that there's all of these unique dice, and there's all different faces, and whenever you use it, it, it does something very cool and very different. So yeah, so once when rolling for an AP check, can include this die, and it, it does stuff, and these, these faces are all explained somewhere else. Uh, in fact, it doesn't go there, it goes down here. So that's what these are for, is that actually goes there, uh, and that just goes in there. Yes, yeah, so you've got two slots for equipment, and these are the dice that go in the slots. Right. 
the awareness chip stays there. Yeah, awareness chip stays here. Since this is where she was last detected. Four action points remaining. So we're going to move the command module four spaces up. Two, three, four. The hamster in the lobby, which is this one, uh, can no longer detect bit. Sorry, the hamster in the lobby here can no longer detect bit because she's in a different area. And she didn't move with any other guard's awareness. Ah, so her awareness chip stays there. So yeah, so bit, while doing all of this movement, wasn't detected by anybody. So that's the last place that they thought that, that they saw her. Got it. Right. Next. Action two. That was just action one. We're on the captain's chip. So everybody moves apart from the bulldog again. So this walker moves to there. That moves to there. And that moves to there. Now, does that change anything? Bite shouldn't be there, should she? Or should she? No, bite should still be there. Um, yeah, I don't think that changes anything. No, it doesn't. Right, access now wants to open the door. Have I got access in the wrong place? I've got access in the wrong place. Access should be there. Access is now wanting to open that door. But seeing that a utility chip is next in the burn cycle, she decides to wait until her next action to do so. So what she does as a second action is she draws another network card. And this time she's drawn shipping manifest. Okay. Now, action number three, she's on a utility chip. So she takes an optimized keypad action. I'm starting to get this now. This is all, this is, it's going to take a while. This is a complex game with a lot going on, but I'm starting to get it. I mean, too many bones took me like four games before I even started to get it. Cloud Spire took me about five games before I started to get it. And once you get it, it's worthwhile. But there is an uphill. Um, yeah, it's 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 a learning curve to get get to know any of the games from Chip Theory Games because they're so detailed, uh, and they're so rich. Right. So this is an optimized keypad action, but there's two inputs. Now we can ignore one of those inputs because it was optimized. Um, we don't have enough dice. We've only got one dice left, so we can't really brute force it because that's going to cost four. We do have this dice, the battery pack, but I don't think that's going to work. So basically it says she's going to ignore the physical input because she's no way to resolve that because there's no physical chip here and there's no physical chip in the team's reserve. Can you use chips in the team's reserve for that? I'm not sure. So we've got this. This is a new icon we've not seen before. This is the alert input, which basically causes her to be detected. So what happens is... She puts her awareness chip on her space. She's been detected. And that's it. It doesn't stop you getting in. Um, yeah, with well, the door is unlocked, right? Door is now unlocked. So we get a free movement inside. Now, does her awareness chip stay with her? Oh, that's interesting. With the door unlocked, access moves into the utility room for free and surveils it. Yeah, no, I, th I think that stays there because that's the last space that she was spotted. Yeah, so basically there's, there must be a camera on the keypad that's detected that she was there, but then it doesn't know where she's gone next. But she's moved into this room with a bead, so we have to roll the surveillance die, which is this one, and we've rolled and we've got that. Now that icon is... Network. No, it's not network. What's that icon? It's an imperative. Ah, right, that's an imperative. So she's get she gets another imperative card. Right, and she's drawn fish fingers. Sorry, fast fingers. I'm definitely getting hungry. I'm, I'm seeing everything as food. The next time your agent collects a cash during a movement action, you may not take any further actions that turn. Ouch. Ouch, that's quite harsh. 
With no guards detecting her, her awareness chip remains in the equipment room. Right, okay, done. So surveilled that room, gone in. They think she's still in the equipment room. She could sneak out of here, go in here and get in there. But there's lovely stuff in here. There is lovely stuff. What was the point of um, accessing a terminal? I mean, we had to access a terminal for the mission, but I don't know what bonuses we got from accessing a terminal. Oh, we got to unlock a door, didn't we? Right, now we're on the network. So, first of all, we have the um, tech chip. So she's going to move two spaces clockwise and land on a hub. Okay. That hub reduces the threat down to one because it is a, a, a layer two hub. She then goes on here and moves her IP one node clockwise from the captain action chip. Okay, so she's not going in. Ah, right. She's choosing not to go in. Interesting. Have I got her in the right place? I don't know if I've got her in the right place. Yeah, I'm not sure. It says she moves her IP one node clockwise from the captain action ship, which is which is there. Finally, the utility chip allows her to move her IP one node clockwise, landing on the utility node on layer two. Okay. This allows her to resolve her shipping manifest card. Right. Okay, got it. Yeah, we've done it right. That's right. Okay. So she resolves her shipping manifest card. So are these network cards where you end up? No, I think it's I think it's each action, each time you move on the network, you land on somewhere, you can resolve one of these. I'm on the wrong cam. Oh, I'm on the wrong cam. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> Just spotted that. Um, so yeah, what she's done, she started, started here. No, no, no. Start, started here. Um, first one was to move to there, which reduced threat by one. Then the second one was the captain's chip, and I was expecting this to go into here. But because of her network cards, she moved to there first, and then the third one moved to there. Yeah. Yeah, each move doesn't have to be the final move. Thank you, Diane. So yes, so basically each time you move wherever you land can trigger one of these. But she didn't manage to land on a utility, sorry, on a tech layer two, but does manage to do that. So that is shipping manifest, draw two equipment cards and choose one. And what is it gonna tell us? She draws two cards from the deck, terminal bypass and a key. Since access already has great terminal benefits with her abilities, Uh, she decides to keep the key. The key equipment card is immediately discarded along with the terminal bypass she didn't keep. She places a key chip in her inventory. Right, okay, so basically, um, if you take this card here, you immediately discard it and you take a key and you put it there. I'm not quite sure what keys do, but I'm sure we'll find out. Um, and the shipping manifest card is also discarded. Right, okay. Now, as a free action, She's going to use her IP spoof. Access may discard a network card to swap her IP's position with the position of any ping on the network. OMG. She may resolve the node that she lands on after swapping. Right. Wow. Nice. So what she's going to do is she's going to discard the cookies network card because she's going to lose it at the end of the turn anyway um, to basically swap her IP with that and then she can resolve that so that's the core wow she got all the way to the core um, so she gets one power putting her on nine increases her network level by one goes up to three 
uh, and also reduces the threat back down to zero. And then her IP is booted back to her access point. So whenever you get to the core, you get to do all of that cool stuff and then you go back to there. Right, routing power. So it's the end of Access's turn. Uh, Access is on nine power, which exceeds her limit. Um, so she routes two power to activate a second die upgrade. Uh, and that is it. Then she degrades the burn cycle, rolls a two, and that degrades the captain's chip. Um, now, can the, can the captain's chip be swapped out? I doubt, I doubt you can, because that would be cheating. Free action, um, altering the burn cycle, discard any action chip in the burn cycle. Oh, you can, but if you discard the captain's action chip when it was active, you advance the threat by two. So you can get rid of the captain's action ship if it's active. If it's degraded, you don't. Awesome. Right. Okay. Yes, there's a penalty. Two threats. Oh, hang on. That's that's a cold cup of tea. I don't want to drink that. Right. Security round two. So, security unit activation. First of all, we do pursue. Are there any detected bots currently in the awareness range? No, we have we have no detected bots. A detected bot, by definition, is a bot with its awareness chip on it. We don't have any detected bots right now. Pursue is the next step. Are there any detected... Sorry, investigate is the next step. So bit and access have awareness chips that need to be investigated. So we're going to start with this one. Both the walker and the hamster are equidistant. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Yes. So thinking that hamster is a bit easier to avoid, we decide to move walker into the equipment room. Okay. So walker moves up by one, right by two, and then up one more and it ends its turn on the awareness chip which clears it so presumably that just comes off however the players unfortunately did not fully consider the implications of this decision bad players the walker is now adjacent to access which triggers its drain ability so the walker has an ability called drain i think it's time for side camp So this is all going on. Need to turn the autofocus on. There we go. So this is all happening here. Yeah. So even though you see how far this uh, this new camera zooms in, it actually zooms in quite a way. <laughs> yeah. It's it's a bit sensitive though. But there you go. You can see how much it's going to zoom in. Um, so yeah, so we've got the drainability of the walker uh, and it is adjacent to access. So, and I remember this part of the rules as well was tricky. It's all about adjacency through doors because the security units treat doors as if they are open. So what does the drainability do? Um, access must return a reserve chip to the supply, meaning that she loses her utility chip. Oh, okay. Maybe the hamster would have been the better choice after all. Fortunately, the walker still cannot see through the door. So access remains undetected and is not attacked. So that's a little unusual. The drain ability kicks in, but walker cannot see through the door. Okay. Then we have the hamster in the lobby. How many games do you get to say the hamster in the lobby? Not many. Um... Oh no, it's, it's not there, it's down here. Yeah, so here we go. The hamster in the lobby is closest to Bit's awareness chip. So it uses its two movement points to land on Bit's awareness chip and clears it from the board. The hamster ends its movement facing the wall since that is the direction it was moving when it reached the space it was targeting. Okay, and then finally, 
Um, let's look at the map in general. Um, finally, we have the last security unit to move is the hamster by the equipment room. So this, this one's moved. This one's moved. Um, so we have this one to move next. And this is on patrol. And the patrol icon that it's got is that, which means it basically moves two spaces down. So one, two. And then um, that particular icon that it has is in the reference sheet. Let's have a look at the reference. Page 30 something. There we go. That is pace. So it moves in a straight line in the direction it faces. If it cannot move in the direction it's facing, it turns to face the opposite direction. Okay, yeah. So what that does is it will move there uh, and then it turns round to face to the way. Okay. And then we activate pings. So the ping on the network activates moving three nodes clockwise. Why does it move three? I need to just refresh myself of the corporation terms network. I can't remember why it's moving three. Ah, right, here we go. So we haven't done moving of pings before. So it, it, it moves until either it lands on an IP, it would land on another ping, it lands on a hub, or it has moved three. So in this case, it moves three, one, two, three, which lands it on a hub, um, it only adds a new ping if there were no pings on the network. So I'm not quite sure how you get a second ping on there. Okay, but now we get to roll the ping die. And is it fixed? Is it going to be fixed? Yeah, so it lands on a hub resulting in the ping die being rolled. Its result adds a new ping to the core. Ah, right, that's it. Okay. So we're going to roll the dice, and the dice roll we've got is that one. Is it that one? That's the one. And what that does is it adds a new ping to the core. So we've now got two pings. So what will happen on future turns is that they will both activate and they'll both start zooming around. And basically what happens is these pings will attack these IPs, and then you compare network levels, uh, and if the, corp, if, the, uh, if the corporation's pings win, then it boots the IP out. Something like that. You get a bit of a fight with the IPs. Uh, then we advance the threat, which advances by two again, even though we managed to get it down. And that is the end of the second round. So there we go. Oof. Yeah, starting to get it. A lot of the game is relatively simple. It's the, it's the movement of the security units and the awareness, they, those are the rules that are going to catch people out. And I think those are the rules that people are going to play incorrectly for their first few games. Thankfully, whenever I play this game, uh, I'm very likely to be live streaming it. And there will be people in the chat who know the game a lot better than me who are going to point out the mistakes that I make. So <laughs> that is the advantage with, with live streaming games. Um, so this marks the end of the tutorial. Uh, the remainder of mission one of this mission, sorry, the remainder of floor one of this mission can be found in a printable PDF on chip theory game slash support. If, the, if that's there, what time is it? It's 10 to 4. We've got time. We can do this. I'm just going to go to this website now and see if that PDF is there. I hope it is. So, where are we? Because it would be nice to finish... Um, chiptheorygames.com slash support and we are looking for yeah okay where am I I'm Europe oh gosh where is it if Shannon's still in the chart tell, tell me if it's actually there because <laughs> I'm I'm trying to find where it is on the website I'm on the support page and the game is not on the right hand side. I mean, the, the game's not actually out yet, technically, so it might not be there. Um, I mean, we could just try playing through it. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure where it is, 
on the website. Because Burn Cycle is not really there yet. The only link to Burn... Shannon had to go to the office. Right, okay. Yeah, I'm not seeing it on the website. The only the only thing I can see on the website for Burn Cycle is uh, about pre-ordering it and the, and the stuff that you can buy. I'm not seeing anything in relation to here. Oh, here we go. Upgrades and extras. No, I think that's just the stuff that you can buy. Add-on content. Core games burn cycle. Yeah, I'm not seeing it there. That's a shame. I'm sure it will be there at some point. It's not there at the moment, but as I say, the game's not completely out yet. Um, but it looks like uh, the remainder of floor one of this mission can be found in a printable PDF. Oh, and then there's something called rescue mode, where you can chain several burn cycle missions together for a high stakes challenge across multiple corporations. I think I'll skip that for now. I'm certainly not that experienced. Okay, so shall we shall we carry on playing for a little bit more? We'll play without the guidance. We will try. We're on our own. I'm scared. I'm very scared now. I like I like scripted tutorials. Because I, I know then that I'm playing right. But with your help, we might be able to do this. Because there are, there are aspects of the game that we've not seen. We haven't seen rebooting the burn cycle. We haven't, we haven't seen that. I don't know whether we're going to see that. So rebooting the burn cycle can happen before any player's turn. I don't think we need to do that at the moment. So what's our objective now? We, we have achieved the objective... We need to get all bots to safe zones. Was that it? I think that was it. Where was that in the rules? Here we go. At the end of a player's turn, if the floor's objectives are completed and all bots are in safe zones, the floor is completed. So that's what we're going to try and do. Excuse me, that's what we're going to try and do now. Okay, so... It is Byte's turn. Step one is rooting power. We're not going to root power. So now we create a dice pool. One, two, three, four. One normal dice. And one elite dice. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Uh, I need to get the chat up on screen because I can't see it. There we go. Chat is up on screen. Run for the elevators. Yep, that's what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> right. So... Actions. Now, the first chip in the burn cycle is a tech chip. Um, we can't really swap it. We can't, no. And we've got that. So, we, I guess we're going to move. How are we going to get to a safe zone? Byte is stuck here in the corner. Oh, they didn't think about this, did they? Yeah. We're... Can't, can't get there. This door's locked. This door's open, but hamster's there. Hamster is right there, right outside the door. We do have the push ability, but that's not really going to help, is it? Hmm. I, I'm not really sure what we can do. We're going to have to move to here. We're going to have to try and open this door. And then we're going to have to move out. It's going to be tricky, isn't it? Start with the command module. Uh, so the command module doesn't get an action. It, sorry, the command module doesn't get to take a turn. You can only take turns with with the bots. And, and you can't choose who you start with. It is always player one, then player two. I can take a network card and move. Ah, uh, yeah, so that's the thing. Yeah, I remember now. This is an optimised action, isn't it? Network card, optimised, take another... Right, okay. So we're going to choose the network card. We're going to draw a network card at random. We've got a driver update. Okay, and now we get to take a normal action, and we want to move to here. Now, I need to move at least two... So I'm probably going to roll. If I roll a yellow and two blue, that will absolutely guarantee it. Okay, here we go. Why can't you swap the captain ship? I can. 
I can, but I don't need to yet. I'm only going to do that when I get to there. Okay, so we've rolled and we've got three movement points, so the blank side can go back in, which is enough to get to there. Right. Now, action number two, and as you say, we have the captain's chip, so we're going to swap that out, and because it's degraded, we don't get a penalty. We're going to swap it out for this one, and I'm now going to take the keypad action, and it's optimised. Okay, so I'm going to draw a keypad card. Oh, this is exciting now. Um, ah, now it's level one, so we need that, and we need that, or we can brute force it, and we can't do that. That is not possible to do, so we're going to have to brute force it, and I need four. Now then. That's that's going to be at least two. Oh, I'm not going to get to move after this, am I? So here, here's the problem. Is I probably will succeed in this, but then I'm not going to be able to do anything else afterwards. So Bite needs to survive a turn getting hit by the the hamster and then make a make a run for it next turn. Yeah, we're going to have to roll all these dice. Okay, so this is what we're doing. We're going to try and brute force the door. Okay, so we've done it. We got five. So the door was brute forced. So we just typed in lots of random passwords and we got in it. Now the free movement is optional I guess so we don't have to move. Let's not move. Oh yeah take the rest of the movement of the command module thank you. How many how many movement did I had? I had one spare. Yeah so let's let's go this way. No let's, let's go this way. Now this is locked as well. Oh, yeah, so we had one spare movement. I got that. Yeah, so I don't have to move through the door. So the door is unlocked, but I'm going to choose not to move through. Now we have a third action, but I don't think there's anything I can do. Because I've not got any dice. So I don't think I'm doing a third action. Oh, no, you can always network. Yeah, so I'll draw a network card. This network card thing is a bit is a little weird. Right, so we've drawn a network card. It's like a whole extra sort of a game. With the optimised keypad, I could have ignored one requirement and taken the awareness. Oh, yeah, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. Let's just undo. Thank you. I'm just undoing it because we are learning. I think those were, those were the dice that I had, was that right? I think those were the dice that I had. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's optimised. Yeah, okay, thank you. So we will ignore the first one. We'll take the awareness chip. So we've been spotted. The door is open. We get the free move to outside. Okay, that's what we're doing. Third action, I'm moving. And now I've got all of this. Uh, the captain's chip was degraded, so only free actions. No, so the captain's chip is gone. If you re if you replace the captain's chip, it's it's not there anymore. So yeah, I, I replaced it. Luke is asking, don't we have to roll a die for the keypad to see if it adds or remove any requirements? No, so you only roll for the keypad if it had that icon there. So that icon there means you roll a dice to determine what that is. This one didn't have any dice on it. So it's uh, so it's fixed. Right. So basically, our third action, I think, is where we are now at, and I think I'm moving, and I'm using all of the dice that I've got left. Okay, and I think we're okay. So two blanks together make a one, which means I've got four movement to share between me and the command module. So the command module is going to go there, and then I've got three left for me. So we'll go there, awareness chip goes with me, because hamster's range is three, there, and I've got one more movement, 
and I'm going to move to here, which means that stays there. I believe that's right. Because the hamster's awareness range only gets to here, and then bite's gone here. So I think that's right. I think that is my... Both security bot units are triggers. Oh, we've got grapple. We've gra grapple here, so it actually costs me one more movement point to get away. So I only get to there. And drain? Okay. Yeah, I haven't looked at... Let me have a look at drain in the reference book. This is what happens when I get left on my own. Take the, uh, take the tutorial away from me and I get stuck. Drain. Where are security units actions? Sorry, security unit abilities. Where are they? Security units drain. When this unit when this unit becomes adjacent to a bot, the bot must discard a chip from its reserve. Uh, well, I don't think it's adjacent. I don't think the walker can drain the bit through the wall. Yeah, I don't think it can. Byte's special ability. When Byte enters a room, treat the first base. Oh, Byte has the push ability as well. We've not really used that though, have we? And taking any action, bite may change the result of one. Oh, yeah, 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 I forgot. Yeah, we got the tumble magnet. So I, I do have an extra movement point. There you go. We'll do that. Drain works through doors, but I don't think it works about through walls. No. We need to look up the definition of the word adjacent, which I hope is in the rules reference. Oh, gosh. It's a big rules reference. Where is adjacency? Uh, adjacency, page 8. Adjacency. Two spaces must share a side to be considered adjacent to each other. Uh, two spaces with a wall are not considered adjacent. There you go. Unlocked doors and de destroyed walls do not block adjacency. Oh yeah, you can destroy walls in this game. Forgot about that. You can strike walls. Smash them. Um, so we could have done that. We could have smashed this wall and gone out. I think it cost 10 action points or something to destroy a wall. Um... So yeah, walls block adjacency. So I don't I don't think it kicks in. Leave the awareness chip for bite behind. Yes. Okay, I think we're good to go. We fixed a whole bunch of errors there. But I think we're good. Yeah. Scott's saying it's an unlocked door. What what's an unlocked door? We're talking about this. Bit bit just moved to here. And it isn't affected by this because there's a wall here. There's no door. There's no door here. So, and, and that's already happened. We did that last time. So I, I think Bit can move there and it's fine. I, th I think we're all good now. Yep, I think we're all good. Right. So, what are we doing next? Network. So it's green, blue, blue on the network. So first of all, green. And it's Byte, which is yellow. And yellow is here. Right, so where can we go? Now, we have a network card. If I end up on layer 1, on a blue, I can get to draw a mod card. Well, I'm on layer 1. No, I'm not on layer 1. I'm on layer 3. Okay, so I'm not going to be able to do that. Um... So, yeah. So, I, I first move to there. Then we've got blue. And I can go around the outside if I really want to. Oh, now this is interesting. I would end up on the hub. Yeah, I'm going to have to read the rules on this. Because the next one is blue, which would put me to there. And then the next one is blue, that would send me all the way around to there to the hub. So I need to read what happens on the network when you land on an IP. Oh, sorry, when you land on a ping node. 
if you land on a ping, you compare your network level to the CEO's network level, the higher network level boots the lower network level. In case of a tie, your IP is booted unless you're level six, in which case you boot the ping. So I don't want to do that. I do not want to get to that point. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to use the... Oh, this is tricky. Oh, no, you can go out. You can go out, can't you? So I think I'm going to move to here with the second one, and then with the third one I'm going to move to here, which reduces threat by one. Yeah, so threat's gone down by one. I think that's what I'm going to do. Oh, Shannon's popped back in. Thank you. I can't get to layer one, can I? Diane's saying I can get to layer one. Where was where was I first? I can't remember where I was. Yeah. No, I think I'm okay with that. Yeah. I don't think I can get to layer one from, from where I was. Unless I've mistaken it. Yeah, so if, if if I was if I was here. No, I was here, wasn't I? I, I think I was on this hub. I was on the red space you got your finger. Yeah, so I, I was on here. So okay, my first one could be to here. Let's go through this again. So the three the three chips I'm resolving are these. So the, the green one first, I could move to here. Oh, and then to here. Is that right? You can move out and continue round to green. So that would be the first one. Then the second one, I would go out to here. And then the third one, I would go to here. Is that right? I think that might be right. So first one is green. I go out and then round. I've landed on green layer two. Then I resolve that one. I go to here and I've landed on here and my network level goes up by one. And then my third one goes clockwise to there and I've landed on blue level one blue layer one, and I can do that, and I can draw a, yeah, so I think that's right, so I draw a mod card, so this is another type of card we've not seen, <laughs> I don't know what these do, okay, mod card is, expando trash, at the end of your turn, if your agent is not detected, Oh no, my agent is not detected. You may treat their current space as a hiding spot until the start of your next turn. Place an objective bead on your agent to indicate this. Okay, so... And it's got two power. Uh, I don't know what that does. We'll have a check, but I think, I think we've done that right. He says. Okay, so mod cards. Yeah, totally new type of card. Let me just have a look where they are in the rule book. Mods, page 25. Uh, mods. Power gained when this mod is discarded, if not installed. Oh, they go, they go down here, I guess. When mods are drawn, they are uninstalled by default. They should be placed in the inventory slot sideways to represent this. Okay. Uninstalled mods have no active effect and take up inventory space. They can be traded as a free action. A bot may discard an, an uninstalled mod at any time. If you do, you get the power. The power reward is still gained even if the mod is discarded due to having too many cards. At any time, an agent may install a mod, rotate the card the right way up to indicate it's been installed, provides a permanent enhancement to the agent. It cannot be traded and still occupies the space in the inventory. An installed mod cannot be uninstalled, discarded at any time. I mean, let's, let's go with it. Let's... I mean, I don't need it right now, do I? Oh, screw it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to install it. We've, it's fun. We've got expander trash. 
Okay, so that was the network step. Then we have routing power. I'm not going to route any power. I don't have to discard down. We then degrade the burn cycle and we roll the burn cycle dice. Do I need to spend two power to install it? No, I don't think so. I, I, I don't remember reading that. I mean, I just read it. Yeah, you just install the mod by rotating it. If you discard it, you get two power. But it, it doesn't cost you power to install it. Okay, slot number one has been degraded. Right. Now it is Access's turn. Okay. So first of all, routing power. We don't want to route any power. Okay, we're now going to build our dice pool, which is seven dice. Oh, there's so many different actions here. It's awesome. Uh, seven dice and two advanced dice. Okay, and we've got this. We've got a key. I need to read what keys do. I'm guessing keys open locks. See how I work that out? Oh, that's clever me. Keys. Please be in the index. Yes, they are. 22. Keys. Several equipment cards are keys. They're resolved in several ways. Yep. Okay. Key equipment cards can be used by the command module to draw a key chip. Yep. A bot with full inventory may still draw a key chip. Yep. If a key equipment card is drawn as part of an... Right. Key chips. Um, keys are generally gained through key equipment cards and by stunning or shutting down a security unit carrying a key. Yeah, so you can attack the security units. We've not seen that. Keys are stored in the key area of a bot's inventory. Yeah, there's no limit to the number of keys you can carry. Keys can be used in two ways, either during keypad actions or move actions. During a keypad action, a key may be discarded to automatically treat all inputs on the keypad as resolved. During a move action, a key can be used to unlock an adjacent door. When used during a move action, a keypad card is not drawn and the bot is not granted any free movement through the unlocked door. Keys may be used in the middle of a move action. Right. Awesome stuff. That's exactly what we needed. Those are the right answers. Thank you, rulebook. So I think access is just going to move. So we're going we're gonna to pass this. We're going to skip that. We're going to go to here. And we're going to do a movement action. And we're going to roll all the dice. No, 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 no. Hang on. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. We've got to get through this door as well. So we're doing, the first action is going to be a keypad action, an optimised keypad action, and we're going to use the command module to try and keypad into there. That's what we're doing. See Shannon's comment above. What's Shannon's comment? Don't forget the command module is making safe. Oh, thank you very much. The command module has a special ability. Doors to safe zones are always unlocked. Oh, awesome. <laughs> so, doors to safe zones are always unlocked. Security units with that as their patrol will ignore these doors. So does that mean I should actually put little green tags on them at the start of the game? Maybe I should. Because if they're always unlocked, then why not? So we're saying that that is always unlocked. That's always unlocked and that's always unlocked. So I don't need to keep at it. Right, in which case, get in. In which case we're just going to move. So we're going to move and we're going to use all of these to move. Okay, we have four billion movement points. Which is enough. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten movement points. So, so a bit goes into there. That's one. Or we might as well move it two. Three, four, five using the key. Six, seven. Is that right? Now, how does the bit I'm not 100% sure about is access is awareness. Access was here, the walker was here, but I don't think awareness goes into a different area. Th 
this is the bit about awareness that I am a little bit confused about because it's, it's whether that door's open or not. The door's unlocked, but I don't think it is open. You can put the pegs in for the safe zones. You didn't put them in. Yeah, okay. Yeah, cool. So yeah, I don't think the awareness goes on there. Yeah, the guard wasn't there when he moved through the door. Ah, now. No, hang on a minute. He's seen here. So this hamster spots access running out of here. Spotted him. And then it goes into there. So, so yeah, that goes there. I think we're good. I think that I think that is access is turn done. Although I could have drawn network cards. Yeah. So action number three, I can draw a network card. Why? Why wouldn't I draw a network card? And now we do the pings. So you don't do degraded ones, but I've basically got two blue action ships two blue action ships for the network um, so we can go to there as one and we can go to there as two and I can I can increase the network level to four can't remember how network level goes down might need to read that again because I'm sure network level does go down um, but yeah that is the end of access's turn so now oh no routing power do I want to route any power no I don't no we're all good so the network card disappears, because I didn't do it. And then we do the corporation's turn. So on the corporation's turn, we do security unit activation. First of all, pursue. Are there any detected bots? No, there are no detected bots. Investigate. Yes, we have a few investigates. So we have an investigate going on here. And we have an investigate going on here. I'm going to do this one first. The closest bot well that's one two three four away one two three four away we don't want to move that one we want to move this one because it only moves two so that has investigated that and then we've got this one one two three four which is the closest so that goes one two and that has investigated that okay and then we have patrol the bulldog stays where it is, and this is interesting because the walker that's here is patrolling and it's moving four, but I still don't quite understand <laughs> the wording of that patrol. And I, I, I always knew this was going to be the, the tricky bit. It's that whole outside perimeter thing. Follows the outer perimeter of its area. Now, an area... is a specific thing that's defined in the game. Area, nine. So an area is any connected section of spaces that is enclosed by walls, doors, and or the edge of the floor mat. Each individual room is an area. So because the walker is now inside the room, is it just now going to patrol around the room? I think it is. It says, follows the outer perimeter of its area, moving counterclockwise. So I think, now that the walker's gone in there, it basically goes one, two, three, four. I think it walked around there. Guards in rooms don't patrol. Ah, that's a good point. Thank you. <laughs> it's only guards in hallways that patrol. Okay, so it doesn't move anyway. Thank you for that. So I think we're done. I think we are done with the with the guards okay which means we now go to activate pings so we have two pings on the network and we resolve this one first because it's on an outer layer so that goes one two three and then we resolve this one which goes one two three now I don't think that's right let me check Corporation. Oh, we should have degraded the burn cycle, shouldn't we? At the end of um, at the end of Access's turn. Yeah, I think I forgot to downgrade degrade the burn cycle. So that's that one. Okay. Um, ping activation. When a ping activates, 
move it on its layer until it lands on an IP, would land on another ping, lands on a hub, or has moved three nodes. How does it transfer out? Because I don't think we're now rolling any dice. If no pings on hubs, they transfer out. Ah, yeah, that's the next bit. Thank you. If no pings were on hubs, <laughs> keep reading, Paul, and the ping die was not rolled. Yeah, so there are no pings on hubs. The ping dies were not rolled. All pings that can transfer outwards do so. So that one now moves to there, and that one now moves to there. Right, got it. So yeah, if you don't roll any ping dice, then everything transfers out. Got it. Thank you. And then step three of the corporation's turn is we advance the threat and we go to threat three. So we did manage to avoid this. Whew. Right. We're going to carry on playing for a little bit more because I think we are at the stage now where we've completed floor one. I think. It is Byte's turn first. And we pass the first action. We pass the second action. But for the third action, we move. We have those action dice. We choose the move action. We roll them and we have enough movement and we get into there. Okay, and that I believe if we then end our turn, we degrade the burn cycle at the end of the turn. So the burn cycle is now shot to pieces. So we're going to have to reboot it at the start of the next turn. But I believe that that ends the floor. At the end of a player's turn, if the floor's objectives are completed and all bots are in safe zones, the floor is automatically completed. So I think we've done. Yeah. So what happens? We're going to we're going to stop the video now because we, we've we've kind of been through the tutorial and we've finished the floor. Um, but what would happen now is that we would basically remove stuff from the board and we would build floor two and we would set up the next floor. We would add bots back into the safe zone in the same position they were on. If any security units were in a safe zone, I don't know how that can happen. Uh, you add them back into the safe zone. Uh, door pegs for anything that was unlocked goes back on. Any bot that doesn't have an imperative card gets a, a, an imperative card. And then you just carry on playing. In a solo game, the turn order also resets. So this means that you will take another turn before the corporation takes its turn. But in, in a two-player game, uh, we basically carry on playing. So we'd set up the new floor, and then it would be Access's turn. And just in case you don't know, uh, what I'm going to do is I am going to show you rebooting the burn cycle, because we probably have to do that. Um at the start of Access's turn, because otherwise Access doesn't get any actions whatsoever. Um, so let's just have a look at rebooting the burn cycle. R, 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 re, reboot, no, burn cycle, 13. So um, yeah, where is rebooting the burn cycle? Here we go. The burn cycle only reboots when players choose this to occur. It can be rebooted immediately before any player's turn. All active and degraded chips are cleared from the burn cycle and returned to the supply. Any unused chips in, res in reserves are also returned to the supply. Basically, you rebuild it like you did at the start. So you will put the captain's action chip, two general action chips in, draw them out and do that again. And then you create the teams and the personal reserves. Um, threat advances by player count. So threat, threat will go up by two every time you reboot the burn cycle in a two-player game. Um, but every player will basically get their um, reserve allocation back and the team's reserve allocation is done differently. I think it's based on uh, the rooms that they're in. So if they're in safe zones, I don't think they're going to get anything. Let me just check where that is. Reserves, page 31. 
Turn order would reset to all players get turns. Oh, right, okay. Turn order would reset so all players get a turn before the corporation. So it would be access, then bite, then the corporation. Oh, right, okay. Starting with the new first player. Oh, all players take a turn. Ah, right, I missed that bit. Yeah. But then would the corporation marker move? If not, that means Bytes managed to get an extra turn out. Okay, yeah. So, are we saying then that it is better for access... Sorry, it is better for... Yeah, so tactically, would it have been better for... Well, not that I could have done it. For access to have completed the floor, and that means both Bytes and access would have both had an extra turn each. Is that right? Okay, no, you're saying it passes to bite. Okay, got it. Right, cool. So, reserves. So, generating the team reserve after a burn cycle reboot. Uh, where is that? Where is that? A room that has at least one bot occupying it will contribute the action chip listed in the room info bar. The room may only ever contribute once per reboot, even if multiple bots occupy it. So basically, there's nothing in there. So if you reboot the burn cycle, when in one of the safe zones, it doesn't look like the team's reserve gets anything. Um, it only happens if you reboot the burn cycle when you're in a room and you get that. Okay, purple IP. What's wrong with the purple IP? Purple IP is fine. Oh yeah, it's a, it's a threat from this one. <sighs> yeah, well that's been it, it's been a blast. We we I'm going to wrap things up now. Thank you very much for everybody for joining me live and for all of the help with everything. I hope this video was useful. As I mentioned at the start, this wasn't a, a sponsored video. Um, Chip Theory Games were kind enough to send me an advanced copy of the game so that I can start producing content. I'm going to be taking it to a UK convention in a few weeks' time where I'm going to be running some demos of it. Uh, and then I've got Ricky Royal coming on, coming around on the 25th of April and we're going to be doing a full uh, two-player playthrough of the game uh, in the afternoon. But yeah, this wasn't a sponsored video. I've basically taken today off work in order to produce this content for you. And I'm only able to do that thanks to the support of the Patreon campaign. So obviously give the video a like, subscribe to the channel if you're not already subscribed. Uh, but if you do enjoy the content that I create and you want to support me directly, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash gaming rules. Patreon supporters do get access to a whole load of extra behind the scenes videos, including me drooling all over the components, uh, which I did earlier on this week, uh, and access to the community Slack channel. But for now, we're going to wrap things up. As I say, I just, I just really hope this video was helpful for some people um, because the experience that I've had today is likely to be a similar experience to what you've had. Uh, thank you very much to Shannon from Chip Theory Games for popping in and to everybody else for uh, their help uh, and basically uh, company as well because I could have done this on my own but it, it's not near enough, uh, not near as much fun. Um, than doing it with other people as well. So yeah, thank you very much for keeping me company. For those interested, oh, it's 4.30, perfect timing. Um, I'm gonna be packing this away now, and in 30 minutes time, I'm gonna be doing a live unboxing of Dead Reckoning um, with a surprise. I won't say too much about it, but if you're interested in me unboxing Dead Reckoning, that will be happening in 30 minutes time on the channel. But for now, I'm gonna disappear. Take care, thanks for watching, and I'll speak to you all soon. Bye-bye.